And I'd like to call the order the Bloomington Historic Preservation Commission meeting for Thursday, July 14th. All right. Um, roll call, Eddie. Okay. Marlene Newman. Doug Bruce. Here. Daniel Schlegel. Here. Sam DeSaller. Here. Matthew Seven. Here. John Saunders. Here. Elizabeth Mitchell. Here. Allison Chopra. Here. Raynard Cross. Here. Duncan Campbell. Here. Derek Ritchie. Ernesto Castaneda. Chris Sturbaum. All right, thank you, Eddie. Uh, so let's. Uh, hey, John, would you guys, I, I know some of you guys, I haven't worked a meeting in a while. Will you guys make a motion or you, you second it? Please tell me who you are so that way I can I can keep track of this. Okay. All right. No problem, Eddie. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so uh, I need approval of our minutes. Allison Chopra moved. That's said in seconds. All right, roll call. Doug Bruce. Abstain. Daniel Schlegel. Yes. Sam DeSaller. Abstain. Matthew Seddon. Abstain. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Raynard Cross? Yes. Motion carries 503. Thank you. All right, let's go on to historic district nomination uh, HD 22 03, 702, and 78708 North Rogers Street. So. So after this evening's news, um, I would like to present the historic district nomination, uh, 2203. Oh, no, no, why is this, this is not? Wrong picture. Wrong picture. Sorry. <laughs> wrong picture. Let me just tell you. Wrong picture. Sorry. I was, this is the wrong picture, but the right address, 702 and 708 North Rogers Street for Bethel AME Church and Parsonage. The petitioners, Beth Alami, have representatives here today, I believe. Right. Yes, awesome. So staff recommends the property parcel number uh, in the packet for Beth Alami Church and Parsonage be designated as a local historic district. After careful consideration of the application and review of the historic district criteria as found in Ordinance 9520, of the municipal code, staff finds the property not only meets, but vastly exceeds the minimum criteria listed in the code. So this is all information about Bethel. Um, this church historically provided a communal space, and it still does for many members of Bloomington's black community in the early 20th century. Prominent members such as Mrs. Maddie Jacobs Fuller, Wraith Fuller, is it Fuller or Fuller? Fuller. Fuller. Maddie Fuller. Jacobs Fuller. Fuller raised a considerable amount of money to make sure that the congregation owned the land and the building. The property meets criteria 1C because it has served as one of the main social cultural hubs of Bloomington's black community as a social hub for congregants and for Indiana University students alike. The property meets criteria 2B because this is an exemplary example of John L. Nichols, perhaps Bloomington's earliest architects of renowned nouns work. The property meets criteria 2G because the building itself, through its elegant design, provides a solid example of late classical revival style with some hints of Tudor in it. Um, the, here is the map with the boundary line. So it has the main church and the parsonage, which is a cottage. And I also wanted to, this, so this is a church that has, as a community, a long history in Bloomington. The, that's not 1883, that's 18, sorry, not 1833, that's 1883, the original location. So Bethel AME used to be located near, near to the courthouse square in a church that they had bought from a different congregation, but they wanted their own building. And you can see at the very end, the steeple of the original church. That's the best photograph I could find of the original structure. When the congregation, I believe, arrived in 1869 or formed in Bloomington. Here is a historic photo from 1945, I believe, with the congregation standing in front of the building. 
And this is Mary Jacobs Fuller, who was an acclaimed singer and organ player. She was a prominent member of the community and she helped raise money to build the land where the current is located using her musical performance. And yeah, she like earned so much money, more than $13,000 in that time's money, which is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily large amount of money in today's money. And this is an image from the interior of the church with the community. When they were burning the mortgage papers because they paid <laughs> off the mortgage in full with a very intense, um, there were, there's so many news articles that are, that, the, that I read, there's so many articles about all the different activities and events that the church constantly held mm -hmm. week after week, month after month in order to pay off the mortgage because buying land and having land to one's name has, and having a building that's paid off has a very profound significance, um, especially for people who have been historically marginalized in the community. So this has been a safe space for many years. It is kept in extraordinarily good condition um, and right because the way the, the system is uh, we cover as the HPC the exterior of the building but that provides a protection for the entire building and property so here are some additional images and here is the here are some additional images of the parsonage which is a bungalow that was um, also lovingly restored with a lot of work from community members uh, some years ago as well. And the packet has much more detailed information about the history of these two spaces, or these two buildings, and the history of the community. Um, and yes, that is my presentation for now. I fairly made service, or was able to give um, the due diligence, or. I really can't say good enough things about this space and about the community that um, nominated it and is still working and inhabiting it. So. Perfect, great. Um, questions? Matthew? Uh, no, no questions. Renard? No questions. Elizabeth? No questions. Doug? No questions. Daniel? Sam? And the only thing I'm curious about is if the uh, person who's representing the Amen Church tonight has anything to, to say further. Absolutely. We have an honor to have been given the opportunity to be on the historic site. We are here at the historic church. I appreciate Elizabeth Mitchell and Gloria Cullen for bringing this to our attention. I think which they tried once before and kind of fell to the wayside. We'd love nothing more than to have this be our church be on a historic this because it is just that, and we enjoy it. Right. Thank you. Uh, Duncan, do you have any questions? Uh, the, only, the only question I have is uh, about the, descript the physical description where in the National Register nomination, it describes it as a, as a Nichols Arts and Crafts influence structure, and you talked about it as a neoclassical structure with Tudor yeah, so I, influences. I, so I, I just want the physical description to be accurate. Yes, yeah, so I was going off the um, Shard Survey, which is not, I, the, the Tudor part, I was having struggle, I was struggling seeing it except for maybe a detail on the arch, but that was come, going, sorry, going off the shard survey. The reality is that that was a very eclectic period in design where architects and especially Nichols was experimenting with a lot of different styles and just doing a lot of different experimental things uh, just before the modern era kicked in, so. Mm -hmm. To print a lot in this building, it's very elegant. So I guess I would just suggest that maybe that description be elaborated to better des describe the architecture, since architecture is one of the criteria. Sounds good. And I think that I actually like the description in the National Register nomination better, but I think uh, your comments about 
Nichols' influence are accurate. I, I know quite a bit about him and his other buildings in Bloomington and um, his, sort of, his sort of trademark was to combine different kinds of, uh, of styles, sort of pre-postmodern actually, to, to sort of pick up <laughs> on different um, so it wasn't the jury after all. And, and actually, what, what's the style called? There's a name for what he was doing. I can't think of what it's called right now. But I, I'd be happy to help you with that description if you want. I, I just think it, I think we ought to be accurate about it. Sounds good. Is that something that would require a motion this evening for um, it? It is something that can be. I believe it can be, if, and any of you who have been working at this longer, be edited for the staff report for Common Council if this were going up before Common Council. To have it really like tweaked and set in stone before it becomes an ordinance. I guess I, just got yeah, I think, that, I think so. that's accurate. I mean, I, I'd be happy to, to make the motion that it include the description and the National Register nomination. And that, that, okay. uh, yeah. that would be an easy way yeah. to. Yeah, let's have your ground. questions. Oh, I'm sorry, that was a comment. Um, I have one question, and I, I just didn't understand, Gloria. You said something about the news tonight. I, I didn't get. Oh, oh, that was the right song. <laughs> oh, I understand. Got it. Right. That's a good joke. I apologize. All right. Um, Shorty Tomlinson, Allison, any more comments? No. <laughs> Matthew? You should all feel very proud of your church and what you've done and, and the history and uh, how well you've cared for it and how well it represents the strength of uh, people who have uh, been oppressed. And it stands in Bloomington as a symbol of that resistance. And uh, uh, I feel lucky to uh, be able to vote yes on this one. Oh, thank you. Bernard? No comments. Elizabeth. No comment. It speaks for itself. <laughs> Doug. Yeah, I'll, I'll add. Uh, it was just a few years ago when I think uh, this group came and, and they this this congregation and you were looking at the the, the uh, parsonage was in terrible shape yes, and and many of us in this on this commission kind of and I think Duncan might have even got us started on it mm -hmm. and we went and we looked at it and said you could make this into something good for the church and and we <laughs> drew it up and saved it and so it's been so neat over the years to see that the parsonage is just it's not an empty lot and it's not some rundown building and i think it showed the same the same care that you've shown for your church itself i think it's an absolutely beautiful building and um i think this is a fantastic and way overdue thank you Daniel? I don't think I have anything to add that's not been said, so. Mm -hmm. Sam? Uh, I would just reiterate what uh, uh, Matt and uh, Mr. Bruce have said, but also that the sort of the tag team of the parsonage with the church, it makes it a much more powerful statement because it talks about how you take care of the people that take care of you. Mm -hmm. and it's you know having a compound like that and having a commitment like that um i i am really happy to see this before the commission thank you duncan a long time coming <laughs> same here all right just meaning the motion move forward uh john can you hear me yes hi uh this is daniel dixon with the legal department this is also uh because you're going to have a motion to forward this, you do need an opportunity for public comment. Uh, Thank you, Daniel. Uh, any comments from the public? I'm um, impressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. We have one more. Oh, yeah. Oh, just as a member of Bethel and a leader, I am very proud. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Did we have a motion on the table? We do. Did we uh, second that or do anything with that? We need a second. I'll, I'll second. Um, Thank Allison you. Who made the motion to send it forward? Uh, Matthew. Matt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. I was speaking about Mr. Kimball's motion. 
Duncan. To change that 40. Oh, the motion to include the National Register. Yeah, I'd just like to tidy it up here, lest it be forgotten. Yeah, she's probably right. We need a second to that motion. Oh, first. second to that. That's Sam DeSoller. Okay. Seconding so the motion to include the National Registry okay. description. I'm sorry. Amend the motion. Amend the, amend the motion to include the National Registry yeah. description in the. Is that agreeable? Okay. Is that agreeable? Are, are you agreed to that, Mr. Mr. Motion or Mr. I, I am. I agree to that. Wholeheartedly. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah. Excellent. All right. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Doug Bruce? Yes. Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSoller? Yes. Matthew Seddon? Yes. John Saunders? Yep. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Allison Chopra? Am I voting on the motion to amend? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, I am voting on the motion to amend. And Reynard Cross? Yes. Okay. Motion carries 8-0. All right. And now we move to the, to the original motion. All right. And this is the motion to send it forward to? Yes. Okay. And so this is the one uh, you made the motion. And it's okay. Thank you. All right. Doug Bruce? Yes. Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSoller? Yes. Matthew Seddon? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Reynard Cross? Yes. Motion carries 8 0. Right, perfect. Mm. So, uh, today, the HPC declares that the property located at 702 and 708 North Rogers Street meets the following criteria for local designation referred to in the staff report 1A, 2, 1C, 3, 2B and 2G. Consequently, the HPC recommends its historic designation under Title VIII of the Bloomington Municipal Code to the Common Council with the attached map. Okay. Sounds good. Very good. Is that interim protection? Well, we can go on to that. So, uh, interim protection resolution to place the interim protection on the property that has been sent to the Common Council with a recommendation of the historic local designation. Today, after the vote, the HP recommends that the council locally designate the property at 702 and 708 North Rogers Street <coughs> as historic and places the property under interim protection pending action by the Common Council under BMC 8.08.015. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. Uh, that will need a that will need a motion and a vote for the interim protection. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Second. Matthew. Second. Doug Second. Second. All right. All right. Doug Bruce. Yes. <coughs> Daniel Schlegel. Yes. Sam DeSoller. Yes. Matthew Seddon. Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. <coughs> Allison Chopra? Yes, please. Reynard Cross? Yes. Motion carries 8 to 0. Great. Thank you. Thank you for coming in this evening. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I will be in touch. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Awesome. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Gloria's covered that with him. So I will be emailing you with information about Common Council in the next few weeks, in the next few days actually, around next week, and see where where we can put you on the calendar. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Have a great evening. <laughs> okay. All right, let's move on to uh, COA, and we'll do staff approvals. Okay. Well, today we have two staff approvals. The first one is COA 22-49, 1109 East 1st Street in the Elm Heights Historic District. 
This is for a tree removal. The hawthorn tree is classified as a small ornamental tree. The radius of its trunk is such that it does require a COA. The distance from the house wall and foundation poses a serious threat to the building's long-term uh, structural stability. There's more information on the packet, but basically the tree was, gro was growing um, about a foot away from the foundations. So staff approved uh, COA 22-49. COA 22-51 at 721 North Fairview Street in the Maple Heights Historic District. Uh, the petitioner requested new roofing. Staff um, did talk, uh, so there was a lot of back and forth with staff about the roofing. If the owner had used the same red three tab shingle it has right now um at least i explained to her that she wouldn't even need a certificate of appropriateness but she wanted to use owen corning oak oak ridge pepper mill gray architectural style shingles so this is the situation um may, may, the maple heights historic district is newly minted and they haven't updated their uh guidelines yet so there's a lot of things that we're, interpret we're trying to interpret when conversations with John Saunders and Daniel Dixon, what comes to staff and what comes to the HPC. So it could be that in a few months when the uh, guidelines have been updated by the community, this will be something that they will put a lot of intense attention to or they will not want to. But in the meantime, um, staff went and looked at a lot of images from Maple Heights to determine whether uh, what type of shingles were being commonly used and what could look appropriate in the area. And this was the solution that was, um, <laughs> that we came to with the owner and um, legal, yes? No, I'm just, I'm just curious, because it's a three-tab shingle versus an architectural shingle. They're both asphalt shingles. Yes. And I'm wondering if it's worth having a conversation to clarify if that's just uh, asphalt uh, for uh, asphalt, yeah, so that was the issue. It's asphalt for asphalt, which normally wouldn't even be seen, but because it did change the pattern of the roof, um, we decided to err on the side of caution and just take a closer look to, up to it. But that said, whenever the Maple Heights has its uh, guidelines, they might say in the guidelines, we don't want to evaluate asphalt for asphalt, you know. So gotcha. this is just like an overabundance of caution. Okay. That's, that's in a newly thinking. minted historic district, so. <laughs> gotcha, thank you. Um, All right. Um, so does this or does this not match their criteria? So when one, so uh, an owner does not even need a certificate of appropriateness if they change like with like in many cases. So if she had used a three tab roof shingle that looked like this one, she wouldn't even have to come before us. According to the Maple Heights Group? According to Title Eight. Okay. And that's pretty uniform across the districts. Okay. With some tweaks here and there. It does vary a little bit, depending on how detailed the, the guidelines for that district are. So why is there, the, what's the issue? Well, um, it's going from a, one type of red pattern to a, a different um, sort of gray pattern, just to make sure that, you know. And I think the other more salient issue is that this district has not updated their guidelines since they were elevated from a conservation to an historic district. And so they just wanted to clarify. Yeah, we're going exactly like <clears throat> Title Eight that says um, changes to the visual aspect of the building have need a certificate of appropriateness. But then the guidelines really go into detail about more granular detail about how that looks, what is staff, what is, um, and then the, H, the HPC manual also has certain things under staff and so certain things that can't be done by staff. So my concern is that we have a standard, and I want to make sure that we're, we're meeting that standard and not just saying, oh, well, you haven't updated yet because we could get that from everybody. Does that make sense? I mean, they could say, well, we ought to update this, but we just haven't yet. Like, I mean, if they need to update their guidelines, then they need to update their guidelines. Well, if that's, up to the, that's up to the Maple Highlights Association to get together and do that, too. Yeah, we can't right. force we can't, them. We can't yeah. force them, but we can. I understand that, but the guidelines as written, this fits the guidelines. Is that but, correct? 
Yes. Yes. It's okay. in fact exceeding, might have been able to just not okay. do the review, but exactly. in, out of extra care, it definitely meets, might even exceed them. Okay. I just want to make sure we're not giving a, a pass for folks who haven't updated it and say, well, this would be the change if it were updated. No, this is actually okay. stricter then because it's going, we're going by Title Eight interpretation, okay. which is the okay. ordinance rather than. The, the standard is if you don't change the color or the, or the nature of the material, it's considered maintenance on a roof. If you change the color or the material quality, it's, it qualifies for a C of A across the board. So it's a change of material, in the, so it changes the appearance. All they would have to do is change the color and they would require a C of A. Right. It's, it's not a, it's, I'm sorry, it's not a guideline issue. No, it's a Title Eight issue. The guidelines, the guidelines can't obviate the rules of Title Eight. They can only talk about how they would like to see it interpreted. But if the guidelines say that they don't want to regulate colors of roof materials, then does that? And the, the commission can choose not to, or can still choose to do it. Hmm, interesting. <coughs> the guidelines are guidelines. They're not new rules. So we like to have them because then we can help, it helps us to interpret how rigidly each neighborhood wants their the guidelines their, the, to, oh, to interpret Title yes. Eight. But um, they are gui they're only guidelines. They're, they're not, they don't have mandates to us. We can make a decision contrary to the guidelines if we want to. So with cases like this, I always consult with both uh, the chair of the HPC and with our lawyer to make sure that each case is actually conforming to the guidelines, but mainly to Title Eight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, so let's move on to commission review. COA 22-50, 202 North Walnut Street. Is the petitioner with us? Um, if the petitioner is online, can you please raise your hands? Your hand, is, you would have to use the, um, sorry. If the petitioner for COA 22-50 at 202 North Walnut Street for new signage is online, can you please raise your hand uh, using the Zoom feature for hand raising? If anybody sees a hand raised on the... I have not seen one. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Gloria, this is Daniel. There is one There is one phone number on here. I don't know if you can unmute them. I don't know if that's who we're looking for. Okay, I'm going to ask to unmute. Can the person with the phone number as a name please identify themselves? Can you guys hear, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, this is Nate, uh, True Blood, Everywhere Signs. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Gloria. Okay, so this new sign consists of an aluminum composite material with vinyl graphics. Aluminum is a preferred material for the historic district. The sign location is in compliance with the historic district guidelines and does not obscure, not obscure, obscure historic materials or the entrance. Here is an image of the, the sign's proposed location. So it is, yeah, it's not touching the, the historic brick or any of the historic windows. Um, so yeah, um, staff recommends approval of COA 22-52. Okay. Uh, Nate, do you have any additional information? No, that's it. It's pretty cut and dry on this one. All right, thank you. Uh, questions? Allison? No, sir. Matthew? No questions. Renard? No questions. Elizabeth? No questions. Doug? No questions. Daniel? No. Sam? No questions. Duncan? No thanks. No questions. That's right. I do have a question. You want to go back? So where is this going? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hold my back. 
Oh, sorry. This, that's, uh, that's just north of the square, northeast of the square. That's right. where landlock records used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who designed that? It's not our purview. <laughs> Well, I can still ask. I would assume, um, Nate, did you guys do the sign work? Yeah. Where were signs? And it comes. Everywhere signs, yeah. They designed that? The sign. The sign. Are you asking about the sign or the sort of addition to the. All of it, I guess, but. Um, That's a, the Ock Fellows building, right? So, is this not considered neon? I know that we have some guidelines around the neon. No, it, it just it just look it just looks like neon. It's just a flat digital print. So, what color is it? Uh, I just have a black and white print out here, so um, it's just a it's just a it's a digital print. I think a white background with uh, black, green, and purple. That's purple? Mm -hmm. Where's the black? EVP's black. Looks like a dark blue. Yeah. Is it dark blue? Okay. Yeah. Reboot, we're through the questions now. On um, comments, no comment. Okay. No. Elizabeth? No comment. Doug? No comment. Daniel? Sam? No comment. Duncan? No. I don't have any comments. Allison? I sure wish we could uh, reject this for some technical reason. Um, am I the only one that's like aghast at the design of this sign? Like it's just horribly done. <laughs> what? I mean the placement. Uh, I mean it looks like I asked. Like I'm, I'm sorry, it's just, it's just not aesthetically pleasing whatsoever. Um, I have she's on a really. It was her. It was her design, okay. and she's on a really really tight budget. She's a young girl. Like she goes to IU, and she's trying to start a photography business in there. So eventually, we're gonna do a really nice sign. But she is, has a very low budget right now to get the ball rolling, and she wants to open really quick. I mean, she can call me and I've got a little Adobe Express thing I could do something better in 30 minutes for, for free. I, I just, I hate to see this in our downtown Bloomington, um, and that's just the truth. I hope that I'm not out of my mind. Yeah, but I'm not sure if that's our, it's not our, purview. our purview. to. I know, that's what I'm saying. I just I wanted to comment, let them like comment on whatever I like. And or something like I think that, it like would be a, a missed opportunity to let petitioners know that this is not the type of the quality. I mean, if you look one building south, if you guys look one building south and there's 15 neon signs with the smoke shop on it, you should approve this. Because that is... No, I, I get it, and I do not approve that at all. <laughs> That's that should be illegal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, anyway. Just <clears throat> okay. No? Uh, we need a motion. Sam DeSoller, I'll move to approve. That's said and I'll second. Okay. Doug Bruce? Yes. Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSaller? Yes. Matthew Seddon? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Reynard Cross? Yes. Motion carries eight to zero. Okay, great. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, let's move on to <coughs> CUA 22-52, 108 West 4th Street. And is the petitioner with us? If um, the petitioner is online, can they please raise their hand using the hand feature? Let's see where to raise your hand. And here, did they take that out? Okay. 
I'm actually gonna lower the security settings so that um, people can unmute themselves. Okay, so if the petitioner Sorry about that. Okay, so um, if is Lauren Clemen or Clemens or somebody else from the city of Bloomington that represents this specific project? Okay. Well. All right. We'll um, move on to the next one. Okay. Let's move on to COA 22-53. 908 West House Street, and uh, Ms. Gerard, are you with us? I think she is. She's, yeah, she's raising her hand. Very good. I'm here. Thank you. I'm here. All right. Gloria? Excellent. So, 908 West House Street, located in the Greater Prospect Hill Historic District. The petitioner, Mary Gerard, is requesting for an addition to the back of the building. The project consists of an addition to a contributing structure and would be located behind the house, subsumed in scale and location with no direct contact with any other any of the rights of way, so it would be slightly visible, perhaps from the front, but not very much. The geometry and fenestrations do not correspond with the historic district. However, the addition would be barely visible from the right of way, and the guidelines do provide for increased flexibility of design regarding fenestrations, the windows and doors, as well as the outline and mass in such cases. Um, however, the staff is recommending approval of COA 22-55 <coughs> conditional on using horizontal left siding to match the house as the siding direction is, um, is, uh, is actually a little bit more, um, I wouldn't say restricted, but it's more carefully looked at in this type of case. So here's the location of the building. And here's the, lo would be the location of the new single story addition behind the house with a connection. And some more details at a plan level. White, sorry, my computer. And here are the elevations and as you can see the the roofing system and the windows do break the pattern. However, they are located behind the building um, and really wouldn't be, if they are visible from the street, it would be barely at all. And here are some additional elevations. And so I believe we have a representative of Greater Pros the Greater Prospect Hill Construction Subcommittee, who I have been sending a lot of material in the last few weeks. Um, and with that, I, I leave it to the commission. Great. Uh, Ms. Gerard, do you have any more, uh, any additional information? Um, this is a house that I've owned since 2003. Um, I'm hopeful that this is my retirement home. Um, and so I'm being very uh, mindful about how I'm updating to make it a little bit more modern in terms of um, systems involved. And the addition, I believe, is a good solution for keeping um, the appropriate scale for the neighborhood, which again, I've owned that home uh, quite a long time. And I'm very respectful of my neighbors and the character of our neighborhood. Stop. Hold on. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Not that that was me. Um, so anyways, um, I'm working with uh, an Indianapolis-based architecture firm. I'm very um, hopeful that the project can be approved and um, uh, with the horizontal lap siding, um, that's something that I didn't know about up until this moment, which, you know, certainly happy to consider that. That 
building or in my house there. I have, I've painted that house three times since I bought it. I'm so tired of painting. Um, but I will be very, again, purposeful and mindful to keep the uh, character of the neighborhood in mind uh, as we move forward past this process, if, it, if this does get approved. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you very much. All right, those two questions. Allison? Um, I'm actually familiar with this architecture firm. I believe it was featured in Indianapolis Monthly or something. And I know that their design is quite uh, modern. Um, have you spoken to the architect about that factor in, in making sure that they can fit within a historic district? Well, I, I believe we did submit the facade sure. design. So that, okay. I've been working with them since February. So that is the design. Okay. Um, this packet is large and I didn't get to it, so um, I'll reserve any other questions until I find that. Okay. Matthew? No questions. Bernard? No questions. Elizabeth? No questions. Doug? No questions. Daniel? Sam? No questions. What page are we on? Duncan? What page is it? Uh, so, Gloria, are you suggesting that be a condition of approval that the side go horizontal? If that is something that uh, the HPC considers, in the end, uh, it is the HPC's decision. I'm just going by the material recommendations and the guidelines. Well, I, I okay. Um, I guess I have comment, but I'll wait. Okay. I don't have any questions. So uh, let's move to comments. Allison? I assume that we're going to be hearing more about this. This is no. the. Uh, Richard Lewis raised his hand. Oh. Is Richard it? Lewis? Hi. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm Richard Lewis. I'm a member of the Design Review Committee for the Greater Prospect Hill Storage District, and I apologize to Gloria that I did not uh, circle back uh, prior to the meeting on this one. Um, I would say that uh, this house, as you can see in the photo that's up on screen, sits on a slight rise from the street. Um, so it appears, uh, based on the rendering, that this addition would not, for the most part, be visible from the street, uh, and quite possibly the sort of cross gable roof line uh, will not be as visible as well uh, from the street. I would say that it, just as an individual, I'm not speaking on behalf of the entire design review committee, but I would feel a lot more inclined, I'd feel more comfortable with this if, if they are able to incorporate a horizontal lap siding that is in keeping with the primary structure um, because vertical sort of board and batten siding is not, is not very typical in, in that period in our neighborhood. Um, and since it doesn't involve public way facade uh, or removal of original materials, it sort of takes a lot of that uh, out of our purview. But uh, the lap siding, just to help that addition blend in a bit more, would, would you know, for me personally, be a bit more appealing. But other than that, I don't have any uh, strong objections. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, comments? I actually think that this is a <clears throat> very careful and clever way to uh, update and, and add some space and uh, much uh, really uh, sensitively done and I don't have a problem approving it. Bernard. Um, I think I have a question based on what the gentleman just said a while ago and it's for those who are more knowledgeable. Um, isn't aren't additions supposed to be of such that it differentiates itself from the main structure? And if that is the case, how does that fit in with the comment about the use of the vertical board and batten siding um, not being in keeping with the traditional siding pattern? Isn't that kind of the aim? Mm -hmm. To differentiate it in a way that it doesn't appear to be part of the original structure? Yeah. I, I, I think 
you can address that in a number of different ways. And the way that I feel that this project has addressed that is they're separate, they've, they've put sort of a neck that uh, separates the new building from the old building. And so you're like, aha, this is where the addition happens. That said, uh, the guidelines don't seem to like vertical siding. And regardless of, you know, differentiated but compatible, um, the guidelines are leaning towards not having vertical siding. And I, I appreciate the applicant's pain about painting stuff, but if they do the, or the horizontal siding in a cement board, they can circumvent painting for the most part uh, over long periods of time. But I think that it's the massing of it and the it sort of addresses where the addition starts and stops relative to the existing structure. Okay, so the design in itself is sufficient to provide that differentiation that one would hope to see in an addition to a historic structure. The differentiation for sure. The compatibility we might argue a little bit about, but you know, I, I think that is a sort of case by case basis based on the guidelines in a particular district. Okay. Are there any comments? No comments. All right, Doug. Yeah, mine's kind of along those lines. Um, uh, my comment in, uh, is that I I like the design, and I think my issue is, is that because it's so non-visible in the backyard, I just wonder how much purview we even have with the uh, even applying the guidelines. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not sure if the guidelines are about having horizontal siding, but if the addition is done in the back, we've typically kind of been fairly hands off on things that are not visible from a public way. So there's not an alley next to this, it's just from the street. It seems to me from the site plan and even driving by it that it's going to be very difficult to see. So I don't have as big as an issue with the guidelines on this. If it was more prominent, I'd probably want to stick more to the guidelines. That's my comment. Daniel? No Sam? Um, I guess I'll just reiterate what the conversation uh, Renard and I had. Uh, and, I, and I hear what you're saying, Doug, about how visible is this from the public right away. Um, it's going to be somewhat visible. It's going to be very background. It's going to be hard to see. But even so, you know, my read on the guidelines is that they don't want vertical siding there. And so I would lean towards respecting those guidelines in this case. Um, it's, it's a very modern interpretation, but I think the massing is what makes it work, and you really can't see it from the street in terms of, I mean, it doesn't overshadow the house. It's very respectful of the massing of the original structure, and that, that for me, is what makes it work. Um, I guess the only other thing I would say is like you want more room for your grill in the in the little alcove. <laughs> you, know, you want a table to put your stuff on. I'm just saying. <clears throat> Thank you, Sam Duncan. Yeah. Uh, well, for one thing, it says shiplap wood siding. It doesn't say board and batten. So that's quite a bit different. That's a smooth siding uh, mm -hmm. with no prominent uh, detail other than the vertical line. Uh, shiplap just has a slight overlap, so to, for weathering. Um, I don't see anything about color, uh, so I, it seems to me, and I don't know what the intention of the owner is, but uh, I, might like, I might like to hear what it is because um, this, if, it, if they use shiplap wood siding and painted the color of the house from 20 feet away, you won't even know it. It's different. So. I, I suspect they don't want to paint it the same color, otherwise that, sh that siding would be as distinctive as it is in the drawing. Um, but I tend to agree, well, two things in regard to Renard's question. This addition is distinctive enough in, in several other ways. The ocular window, the horizontal band of windows, it's, uh, it's, it's detachment from the house with a, with that little, that little hallway is called a hyphen architecturally to attach new to old. <coughs> And, and I think that those are all the kinds of things you see in, in additions to historic buildings all the time. Uh, they're almost cliches about how to make something distinctive. So I think regardless of the siding, uh, it works. Um, 
I drove by there also, I was worried about the roof line showing above the pyramid because the pyramid roof is one of the most distinctive things about the original house. But the house is up on a rise and uh, you almost can't get far enough away that you would actually see that cross gabled roof. I, I, I really don't think it'll be that easily visible. Plus it's back from the house quite a ways, which makes it even less visible. So I've dropped my concern that with the cross gable. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, I, I think it's so distinctive that I would almost lean in the direction of making it more, more distinctive or better distinct, distinctive in a better way. The, the distinction has already been stated pretty clearly. So to put horizontal siding on it and paint it the same color as if you're going to be more compatible seems to me to be bad thinking in terms of design. Um, I'd rather see it stand alone. Uh, the massing and, and the general shape and size compatibility is there, um, so I, I, I don't really have a problem with the siding. I, you know, I, I, I live with it either way, but um, I, I, you know, if I were voting, I'd vote for, for it the way it is. I would like to know what color you're going to paint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's Mary. We are looking at a product the company's name down from Nakamoto Forestry. This is a company that creates siding, wood siding that is guaranteed no treatment needed for 99 years. I cannot imagine wanting to paint any more than I know I'm going to have to from the main portion of the house. Um, and to the uh, comment that we are trying to define a space very intentionally to be a uh, component to, but not mimic the main house. Um, that's, and, and uh, Neon is a modern bended uh, architecture firm. Um, and they have really taken uh, a lot of effort to try and create this architectural uh, interest, if you will, in the in on the property for the property for this concept and project um that will be i actually said this when i met with them back in february i want people to turn on the euclid and go i would have never guessed that is there because of the um the addition just being a, it stands by itself but yet by that bridge piece being there it it's it's just so crafted into again defining space but yet once it's done it's going to be a wonderful home for me to move back into i just know that but back to the painting it's i don't want to paint the siding on the addition i don't so what color is the wood is it going to be the chard it's not going to be the chard it's going to be a soft natural wood again um i don't know if you guys have noticed on these plans they're called the architect firm is calling this the garden house the garden the exterior is almost as important as our interior so i want a very soft background for any of the gardens that are built around it um so i want a very natural uh wood tone uh a very soft wood tone but no not the chart they, they can do the chart on the mid-century modern stuff up in indy not down here yeah thank you okay thank you thank you uh, any comments from the public? <clears throat> okay. I don't have any additional comments, so we need a motion. I move to approve without any additional restrictions or anything. Second. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. You won. That was Matt. Sorry. No, thank you. I got you. Okay. Doug mm -hmm. Bruce? Yes. Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSaller? Yes. Matthew Seddon? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Reynard Cross? Yes. Motion carries 8 to 0. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, evening. Good luck with your project. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, so let's move on to COA 22-54. 642 North Madison Street. So this COA, the request is for the uh, repairing light fixture attachments and repairs to the roof. These are 
things that are repairs like with like and usually would not even be coming in front of the HPC. However, um, Dimension Mill is requesting BUEA funds right now, which require a certificate of a, some sort of oversight by the Historic Preservation Commission. So the proposed project or funding would go towards the protection of the historic brick, which is currently being quickly deteriorating, deteriorated by the existing lighting fixture. And there were also completed roof repairs, which are not visible from the street. I put some additional information here, which is also on the packet regarding the 22 exterior lights that were installed as part of the original building renovation in 2018. Uh, the lights are fine, but however, the bricks are being um, quickly damaged by the fixtures as they are placed right now. Therefore, the money would go into completely revamping the fixtures. The person who's going to do this has already done uh, various on the property and uh, Gretchen, who is present and representing the, the petitioner um, can comment a bit more on that. So the money funding they're requesting is to be able to complete the project throughout the entirety of the structure. Gretchen, do you have any additional information? Uh, just that you can see, uh, you can even see in this photograph, uh, the light that's right to the right of the sign looks like it's dangling a little bit down. And so uh, these light fixtures are actually very, very light. Uh, it's a, they're, uh, but they weren't installed correctly on this older brick. So for, you know, the mill's been open not quite four years. And uh, since we've been open, we've been watching them gradually kind of pull out of the brick uh, as the, the brick deteriorates, the, the, the way the lights are fixed to the brick is insufficient and correct. So they, they pull out and then you've got exposed wiring there, which is of course a hazard. So uh, we've been trying to do some, we thought that if we used longer screws that would help and, and really what we needed was a skilled mason to install them correctly. So uh, that's, that's our project and uh, we can walk around the building outside at any time and you can see uh, various of these lights in um, stages of sag. So we, we feel pretty sure that at some point or another they're all going to suffer the same fate as, as the few we've had already. All right, thank you, Gretchen. Uh, questions, Daniel? No questions. Matthew? No questions. Renard, no question. Elizabeth, no question. No question. Doug, Sam. Yes, can you talk us through the methodology they're going to use to ins reinstall the light fixtures? So the way the lights are affixed right now, it's just, uh, if you can imagine, here's the brick. There's a few screws, two screws that attach the fixture to, uh, to the brick. There is no housing behind it for any of the electrical uh, stuff. So the mason who repaired a few, um, when he pulled, popped the light off, put a, a metal structure plate behind it to support the fixture more and then used masonry screws with the anchor uh, to ensure that they're you know, attached with the proper um, screws and housing, for lack of a better word, to, to the brick, not just a, a regular screw going straight into the brick. Is, is there any documentation of that in the packet? Um, well, we didn't, uh, when he came out to repair them, we, it's quite hot, so we couldn't get a photograph of what that looked like, and it's behind the light, so now that it's complete, unfortunately, there's not a, there's not a good way to do that. Thank you. Duncan? I'm not, uh, yeah, I, uh, the problem is, I mean, from this picture, the one of the light that's dangling, it looks like they drilled right through the brick to pull the wiring from the inside and then just screwed the scutcheon of the lamp into the brick itself, probably with a tap-on screw or something like that. I mean, the, the historic protocol is, is to put it into the masonry joint, not into the brick, mm -hmm. and do it with, a, with, do it with an anchor because the, 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 the mortar joint is replaceable, easily repaired. So I, I right. would, so I don't, I don't like the idea that you're still going to be attaching them to the brick. That that's not the right way to do it. The right way is to attach it into the mortar joint with an anchor. There's a whole system that for doing this on historic buildings. 
I may not be the, I may not be representing what he'll be doing correctly. So this is um, the mason who works for Golden Hands, and um, uh, the way the lights are, are fixed now, um, some of them look like the screws are going into the mortar, and some of them don't. You know, by the time you're on the when you're on the back side of the building, um, sort of where the the other sign is on the, the far right of the corner, those those lights are. I don't know, 50 feet in the air, it's very high. So it's very hard on the ground to even see where it's attached, if it's on the brick or on on the mortar. But um, I may not know the correct way to describe how he is fixing the problem, but um, but he is a mason and um, you know we had had electricians come out to try and fix it before and that didn't work, they kept sagging. So um, I'm happy to incorporate any of that um, guidance into how the repair is done for future, you know, for future repairs. Well, I, I there don't have there any, are I, recommendations for that. Glad to include that. It's pretty clear that they need to be repaired. I, I just, you know, part of the description is that the brick are soft. Actually, these brick are not soft. These are kiln dried modern bricks from the 20s. They're they're cracked because of the of the either drilling holes through them for wiring or for the way they were attached. So I guess I'd like to see a protocol that repairs the brick and also how exactly these are going to be attached because it'll just happen again if they're not attached correctly. And, and it, it goes to preserving the building in the long run and of course in your interest that's what, that's what you ought to be wanting to do too. It sounds like it is what you want. Absolutely. To do. So I, I wonder I guess what I'm going to suggest is that we uh, postpone a decision on this until we see exactly what that application will be, will look like, so we can so, comment on it. So that I know what I would need to secure, uh, are, are you suggesting that the mason come back out, remove a light, and that we photograph exactly, like or make a video or something? Or, or just provide how a just, just provide a or to have a description written? Or just provide a description of how exactly he's going to do it. Mm -hmm. Detailed drawings are great too if they can do that. Yeah, I mean a sketch or something like that would help. And I, I mean, I, I'd be happy to come and look with him if, if he wants to do something at the building. But I, I mean, for the commission, we need something that goes into the record so we, you know, we know how it's going to be done correctly and from now on, let's say. Let's say. Sure. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Allison, did you have a question? Um, yes, two questions. My first question is, um, sounds like this is, and this is a good question, but this does not comply with the application process fully. And we had a situation like this a couple weeks ago where we weren't provided sketches, we weren't provided details, correct? So, yeah, um, Dan, Daniel Dixon, if you are around, um, like, want to read like the Title eight a description of the required documents for application? I can also yeah. open up. <clears throat> so. Uh, our, our local code tracks the state statute for this um, and unfortunately it's not it's not the most helpful thing but it essentially says that um, detailed specifications aren't always required photographs aren't always required it's sort of up to the discretion of the commission on a case-by-case -case basis of what they need to help them make a decision so it's there are there are certain things that I think we have some concrete expectations of what we would ask a petitioner to provide sketches and drawings of. Uh, other things um, may be a little bit more difficult to foresee what would be helpful to the commission in making its decision. Thank you. Um, my second question is is probably for Gloria. Um, the this is. We're just going through this process for these folks to apply for view and funding. Is that correct? They are already that? they are already in the process of applying for the um, historic facade grant, which is a yes. grant that the BUAA offers, but which is for historic properties or historically rated properties, not necessarily within a historic district, but rather having a rating, and therefore there has to be some oversight 
by the Historic Preservation Commission, especially in a historic district like this mm -hmm. one. What does some oversight mean? This. I mean, can it be something else? Or? Um, do you have, Daniel or John, do you have historical precedents of how, um, or Duncan in the past, was it through certificates of appropriateness or was there another system? for BUEA facade grant applications. I, I don't know for sure if they were if they were C of A's. Um, it hasn't always come up for a BUEA grant, you know, the, the sort of technical detail. Um, it hasn't, they're not always because of some failure that we're trying to justify or rectify. It just happened to be requests for money for to do facade repairs. We're usually shown what those repairs are gonna be in a you know in a sort of typical way we would get it in a C of A, and we're and, and the intention is that we are here to comment on it in case it's going to the left when it should go to the right or vice versa. So so they just want some oversight expertise oversight. So that's what we're supposed to be doing, which is why I'm very concerned about how they're attached. It clearly failed. I Golden Hands is very reputable. They, their masons generally know what they're doing, but I'd just like to see exactly how they're going to put them on, on there. So there's no more damage. These 50 lights did a lot of damage to this building. Well, the Golden Hands owner is on this advisory. Sorry? Is that correct? Sorry? Uh, the Golden Hands owner is on this committee as an advisory. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that there's not any conflict there no, or at the BUA level. So I'm not an issue of conflicts, it's issues seeing what the technical attachment I mean, looks like. If the owner is getting paid for a project, <laughs> doesn't that sound like a conflict to you? Maybe at city council, but not here. No, it doesn't. Really? He's not voting. But as far as the, the comment and advisory capacity, that's clearly, I mean, to influence this Chris body. Chris isn't is here. Yeah. He's not here. I understand that, but if this so is going. there's no conflict. Okay. Well, I don't understand, sir, but I'm saying going forward, I would expect for the petitioner, not for the owner of the company who's going to be receiving funds. And we have a process for should this be to recuse themselves from meetings if that's the case. Right. It's, it's already being handled. It's not, it's it's not being handled because someone's brought it up. Right. Please don't argue with me. It's obviously a conflict. And you know that. <laughs> if you recuse yourself from a meeting, that's to avoid the conflict. Allison. Exactly. But we had no one had brought that up that that might be an issue in this case. The only time that a commissioner recuses themselves is if they are present. The commissioner is not present. It's not a commissioner. No, it's, it's advisor. the advisor. The advisory yes. member is not present. If the advisory member were present, he would recuse himself. He or, so he, same, would. he or she, they would, yeah. Okay. So let's um, move on to comments. Matthew, do you have any comments? No comments. Bernard? No. Elizabeth? No comments. Doug? Yeah, I, I, mean, I agree with what Duncan's saying. Um, um, and I think I'd like to see, uh, my understanding is they've already done some of these repairs. I, with that Richard, two of them we repaired two okay. that had fallen completely out because it was an electrical hazard okay so so we have 48 ish more to do so uh getting it it's done right well like it's 20 it's not it's okay. not 50 i'm not sure where that's coming from it's about 20. okay so so i i yeah i agree with duncan and and i think that just to make sure that this is done uh, correctly, yeah, we always want, I mean, we talk about this all the time when we're dealing with even just signage downtown around the square. We want things put in the mortar joint as opposed to the brick um, because that's uh, <clears throat> way less damage. So I think just having an idea of how they're going to attach them, I don't think we need a drawing. I think having a written statement of what they're going to do would be the way to go. So I don't know if that means we <clears throat> hold off on voting on this until the next time, but I'll our options I'll, are to postpone it. Yeah, yeah. Or to deny it. Okay. At this point. Okay. So Got it. Or approval. Or approval. Yeah. Or approval. Yeah. That's all my comment. Daniel, any comments? No, I I agree with what Bruce just said. Yeah. So. Okay. 
And Sam, comments? Uh, I, I would just reiterate what um, Doug said and that I would like to make sure that the fasteners are not going into the brick. I would like to see how they're going to remediate the damage to the brick from the current installation. And, uh, you know, there's going to be some waterproofing issues in there as well. So if, if whatever description, however they want to do it, whether they want to do it verbally, whether they want to do it through uh, drawings or details or um, annotated photographs, it doesn't really matter just so long as they cover those bases. Uh, but, but I would uh, recommend that we hold off on doing this provided that the timeline, uh, it doesn't get automatically approved. Are we still within the next? So no, um, the, this was, the application was entered on um, the 24th. Therefore, it would expire before the 28th, which is our next meeting. So you would have to approve an extension of an additional 30 days or, or deny, deny it. it. Okay. For, yeah, so the difference, so I noticed that the difference between denying and extending is that extending they could present on the 28th. If you deny, they could present on August 11th. Okay, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm happy to um, make a motion to uh, provide an extension, but we'll get there. Uh, just just to clarify to you, for an extension or petitioner does have to agree. Okay, I'll, yes. We uh, agree. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I don't have any comments. Allison, any comments? So many in my head. No, out loud. Okay. Uh, any comments from the public? Mm -hmm. All right. Hearing none, uh, we need a motion. Uh, I will move to uh, grant the petitioner an extension to provide more documentation to address the concerns of the commission that they might present at the next HPC meeting, provided that it does not get automatically approved under the current timeline. Do I need to add anything to that? Okay, I don't think so. This is Elizabeth Mitchell, I second it. Yeah, you got it. All right, everyone. Right, okay. <laughs> Doug Bruce? Yes. <laughs> Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSauler? Yes. Matthew Seddon? Yeah. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Allison Chopra? Yes. Raynard Cross? Yes. Motion carries 8 to 0. Okay, Gretchen, we're, you have an extension. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. All right, let's move on to uh, COA 22-55. 923 East University Street. Are the petitioners with us? Well, John, so, so Allison, so this is one of those examples. This is a client, so I would, I think the petitioners are online right. uh, as well. They want me to present or answer any questions and then I, we still do it that way where I leave the room basically yeah. for discussions or that's what we've done. And well, I don't get to vote on yeah. this. I've, yeah, I've been explaining that process yeah. and yeah. I think it's just fine. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to point it out. Thank yeah, you. No, Thank you. Appreciate that, Doug. All right. Okay, so COA 22 55 uh, for 923 East University Street in the Elm Heights Historic District. Sarah Howell and Terry Hayes are requesting for the full demolition and reconstruction of their detached garage. So here are staff comments. Staff has been in contact with the owner since last year. The owner has made it known that the garage suffers from both de from a deteriorated condition and does not meet the needs of the family as it is too small for their current uh, car parking needs. Historic preservation much balance, must balance both the integrity of the historic fabric and the useful con and the continual use of the space for the stakeholders. An argument can be made that the structure poses an immediate and substantial threat to public safety as interpreted from the state of deterioration, dis disrepair, or structural instability. However, staff requested that the owner submit additional information. The owner did submit uh, an additional written statement and some additional photographs, which you shall be seeing. Um, and an argument can also be made for the following. The demolition is necessary to allow for the development in the commission's opinion, this is why it's so important to have all of you here, 
is of greater significance to the preservation of the district than it is the retention of the structure or portion thereof for which demolition is sought. The garage would, so there, the garage would be rebuilt in the same form and a larger size, would maintain the patterning and would retain much of the original material while providing additional space for contemporary vehicles. So staff had requested, recommended, requested additional information in order to recommend approval or, or not recommend approval. The owners have sent in additional material. The Neighborhood Association also commented and uh, um, staff is split on this one. So um, staff rec recognizes the needs of the owners um, and there is additional material that they did send, but it would be really nice to have a structural um, sort a structural study to see because there you will see in a second before. So the Elm Heights Historic District Construct District Construction Subcommittee were also split with this one. Um, and I did, I did print out a previous application that they had submitted and, and had not the current owners, the previous owners of this property in 2018 for your reference. We can get to that later, but it's here if necessary. Um, so I'm just going to read what the Elm Heights subcommittee stated. There are mixed opinions on the removal rebuilding of the garage at 923 East University. Since the same garage has been to the commission with different owners, and that is referring to 2008, uh, COA 2018-87, it would probably be a good idea to review that meeting's findings. It actually came to the HPC twice. There was a lot of discussion of whether or not it was appropriate to tear down an outbuilding because it is too small for original use. According to the guidelines, I think it is a negative. My opinion is okay to sensitively, sensitively modify slash expand, but not remove an outbuilding. I think it's great if you, sorry. I think it's great if you turn an outhouse into a tool shed or a chicken coop to the shed, but not remove them. I can't think of anything that tells the story of an area better than its outbuildings, fences, and accoutrements of an era. As much as I love a beautifully restored house, much of its history is lost without its setting. That's Jenny Southern. And, and she also shared that Martha Harsanyi Hars feels differently and thinks the new plan is reasonable. And they haven't heard from the other members. So the comments, um, the owners also commented the following. They attached additional photos that identify some of the damage that exists within the current garage structure. Our concern is that all past repairs have been patchwork using a variety of different materials and complete, completed by different contractors. The work is poorly done and does not support the historical integrity of the well-maintained home. To repair the structure, we believe the existing materials can all be repurposed and used to maintain the historic look while creating a garage that can be utilized. At this point, we have not had a structural engineer assess the garage. Our statement of deterioration is based on home inspection and a home inspection report completed in January 2021. And the fact that water runs down the, into the structure after any rain because of the eroded floors and damaged walls. The bowing and cracking garage floor does not allow the garage door to shut, causing rodent and wildlife to freely enter the garage. The inability to properly seal the garage pro poses a safety and security issue. The lintel, which is made of stone, is beginning to sag because it is not properly supported. Without taking action, these issues are going to continue to progress and could eventually result in the crumbling of the structure. Ideally, we would like to have this presented at this month's meeting, and then if it is determined that a structural engineer is needed, we could move forward with getting that report completed. Please let us know if any other information can be provided so that's our communication with them they did have their next door neighbors who said um, they asked their neighbors to send in letters which they did and the neighbors were both um they both approved or were supportive of this project so i'm going to show you images um the plans now um so this is uh uh plan that has the existing garage si size 
and the proposed two-car garage uh, adjacent, or well, the totality of it would be the two-car garage. And here is another floor plan that shows uh, how the garage would look like. There would also be some adjoining structure between the garage and the existing building, but it would be tucked away and would really not impact very much sort of the patterning of the of the outbuilding too much. Um, so here are some elevations. The packet also has a huge uh, has a plan with the sheet with a lot of drawings, not drawings, sorry, a lot of additional photographs, but I'm just showing you some of the photographs that the owners shared showing some of the different types of damage that the building is suffering right now. You can see the sagging lintel, the rear roof, um, the, there's not really a support between the brick and the roof. And you can see some of the water damage and, and the bowing walls. And um, yeah, so my, I, yeah, I'm somewhere in between with this one, mainly because it is an outstanding building, which is the highest rating of a building, which means that the more careful intervention, the better. But I also understand that if a building can't be used as it was meant to be used, um, it can cause problems with the stakeholders in terms of livability and usability. So, um, ah, yikes, I'm kind of going to throw this one to all of you because mm -hmm. <laughs> I am internally as split as the committee might be or not, or the commission might or might not be. Okay. Um, Terry and Sarah, do you have any additional information for us? Yes. Think so, no additional information at this time. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move to questions. Uh, do, you, do you want me to say anything before I, yes, on behalf I, for them as yes. well? I mean, I've got some additional okay. notes that we had in some discussions that might not have been really apparent. Um, and first, I, w I, I was on the commission when this last one came before us, I think in 2018, I remember that, and that was a lady that bought the house and had her mother there and was trying to do a ramp or something, if I remember. Mm -hmm. So when when uh, uh, Sarah and Terry came to me, um, you know, this is a house they bought to live in, and as we say, age in place, and we know that's an issue with some of these historic homes as well. Um, so some things that I just want to point out on this is that the inside dimension of the garage is 11 feet wide. I mean, it's, it's very narrow. They cannot park in it now because it's so small. So they park in there. The driveway has the, the concrete uh, lane, and they'll maintain that. They're actually going to repair some of that. The, the face of the garage sits about 90 feet back from the street. So again, it's not, it's not parallel to the house. It's not in front of the house. It's, it's very far. Sub, uh, uh, you know, as a uh, subjective to the house. I mean, it's, it's back behind the house. Uh, the connection won't be visible. Uh, they're going to reuse, we're gonna, it's our goal to take the brick that, again, as you saw from some of the pictures, it looks like the garage has either been repaired or cobbled together over time. There's a small lean-to kind of addition to the face of it that has a little bit of a shed roof on it that has no foundation under it. The deck between the garage and the house is a modern deck that's just sitting on the ground. There's no post, no support structure. I think that's where all the damage in the water and the termites have gotten in. Uh, the lintel is cracked. Uh, so our goal is to try to reuse all of the brick that we can to face the front of this garage. So what's visible from the street will be the same brick that we have and as much of the brick we can use. And then we'll try to match the brick the rest of the way around the garage. Uh, we're doing period details with uh, another limestone lintel. We're going to use a period garage door. I think, uh, Gloria, they had given you some samples of things a while back, or they, or they certainly have samples for the shingles and things. The garage, you know, the house is a two-story or one-and-a-half-story home, so I don't think that we're out of scale. The neighbors are, are fine with it. 
Um, you know, this isn't a single story house with a garage that's going to massively overshadow it. And again, it's about 90 feet back. Another issue for them, other than the aging in place, is the fact that because they've parked outside, they've had their cars broken into. Um, and so they can't park in the garage and they really want to be able to park in the garage and walk into their house without having to go back outside. Um, let's see, what other notes did I have? Yeah, other than reusing materials. Um, that's really about it. Yep. So I don't know if you want me to stay for questions or if you want me to leave. I don't remember how we, we do that. We want you to stay for the question portion. Okay. And leave for the comments. Okay, Great. there we go. Thank you. All right, Matthew, do you have any questions? No, I have a, I have a number. Um, one, one for the owners. When did, when did you purchase the property? Sarah, when did you purchase? Yeah. It was purchased January 2021. Okay, so, and the garage was in pretty much the condition that you're showing it uh, in the pictures in January 2021. Uh, Your inspector mentioned it. Oh, that's gone. Yes, that's correct. The okay. garage was in this condition, and when we did our inspection, they warned that there was several concerns with the garage. But yeah, it was in the condition that it is in. Okay, um, maybe this is a question for Gloria. Um, does this district have any guidelines about um, changing sizes of the outbuildings? So I, I hear what you're saying about that it's not bigger or taller, but it's twice as wide. I hear what you're saying about it's far back, but when I look at the original picture, you can definitely see it. So it's going to, to me, it's going to kind of look differently, uh, quite differently garage-wise than it does now. And so I'm just curious if the guidelines uh, for the Elm Heights have concerns about outbuildings in that regard. I, it, it bothers me, but I'm trying to figure out how worrisome it is to the, to the historic district. So. Yeah, I would have to actually look up the guidelines. Look at page 31. Guidelines. Oh, so. uh, Sorry, Sarah. Page 31. Yeah. Oh, okay, 31 and 37. Sorry, I need to like look it up here. My screen is slightly encumbered right now. So, Elm Heights, Let's see if the PDF opens. <coughs> okay, okay. It doesn't appear, it doesn't appear. Not great timing for a pinwheel of that, but we shall deal with it. Okay, page 31. Thank you for bearing with me. Okay, so garages and service buildings. Um, so a certificate of appropriateness is required for the following bolded items. Removal of a historic garage or service building and changes to the <coughs> construction of. But they also have some additional text. There are many instances, yeah. So there's an explanation of them. To retain and restore original garages and service buildings along with their inherent materials and feature along cleaning, repairing, and maintaining. But it doesn't have a lot of... That's the goals, the preservation goals for yeah. garages and service buildings. And it's, uh, the goals say... The goals are to retain and restore original garages and service buildings are the main goals for the... Um, Retain and restore garages. Okay. C thirty-seven. Thirty-seven has to do with demolition. Yes. So six point zero um, on page thirty-seven. 
The purpose of the local historic district is to preserve and protect the building settings and places of architectural and historical significance to a neighborhood or community. This makes it inappropriate to remove structures that have been listed as contributing to a district. And it's contributing or above. Um, and then it talks about the yeah, demolition of all primary, secondary, and accessory structures, including contributing walls and fences. So this includes the garage. And that's where we get um, the things that I had read earlier about the structure posing immediate and substantial threat to public safety, um, that the architectural, historic or architectural significance is such that it does not contribute to the historic character or that the demolition is necessary to allow for the develop, a development that in the commissioner's opinion is of greater significance to the preservation of the district than its retention of the structure or portion thereof for which demolition is sought. And then there's um, about tornadoes and fire and flood. And finally, that the property cannot be put to any reasonable economic economically beneficial use without the approval of its demolition. So this is actually based on Title VIII and on state statute. Um, so what the guidelines for this historic district are actually basically what Title VIII says already. Um, and those are the things to have into consideration is, will the, will the reconstruction of the garage be of better benefit to the community as a whole in the long run? Um, and this is a question that the commissioner's opinion, so, so it's basically food for thought for, for all of you to decide. Um, Elm Heights is one of the historic districts where demolition is really, 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 really not the first, second, third, or fourth option. That said, it's, it's still an option, so. I think you're missing a couple of really easy. <laughs> Etc. Uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. I have no further questions. Thank you. Um, I just have a few questions. I'm looking at the, the plans, and I just want to make sure this garage is going to be attached to the main house or detached? Because one yes, of the, attached. Okay, because one of the where there's drawings, a deck now will get removed and that'll attach to okay. the, that area okay. between the house and but the But it's garage. detached now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, with regards to the last point, the structure of the property cannot be put to any reasonable economic beneficial use without the dem demolition. Is the, was the garage, firstly, was the structure built to be used as a garage? Mm -hmm. Certainly, it yeah. was a garage. Yeah. I guess yeah. the cars were tiny, and was it built at the same time as a house? Was it built after, before? The, that's a good question. Well, the the, the, the brick seems to match. It would probably be a Sanborn map or something to to show that. I can't answer that with certainty, but I would say the brick seems to match. It's kind of cobbled together, so it leads me to believe that it it is it either had. Somebody either, well, it seems to be of late in Bloomington, drove into it at some point. It seems to be a recurring theme in town lately. Hmm. Or it's been added on. I think the, the, the part that's least visible at the very north end has been bumped out. So maybe over time, somebody's car got larger and they expanded that uh, because the brick is different there. So I, I can't tell you with certainty that it is. Um, but, I, you know, the brick seems very close to being the same as the house, so. Okay. And it would take a Sanborn map, I'm sure. Oh, go ahead. I can chime in and say that they have definitely changed. I mean, we have one complete wall that is not made of brick. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That matches the addition on the house. So they have changed the structure of the original garage already. Yeah, there is an addition to the back of the house, that's right, that is newer. And my last question, and without any, let me start again. Is it possible to repair the structure that exists, add to it, just create an addition to the structure once repaired so that functionally it will 
be able to meet the purposes for what for for two car garage and still keep some of its historic characteristics we we looked at something like that my my issue there is i parts of the garage don't have a viable foundation right now like some of these older older structures were built just on the dirt so and and it would i think it would change the look what we've tried to do is rebuild something that could look like what it does now it's just going to be larger as opposed to adding on I, I, this roof structure is not the kind that you can it's not trusses it's kind of cobbled together so i think to add on to it you would have something that would look completely different and maybe not nearly as compatible as what we have right now or what we're proposing to do if that makes sense yeah. Elizabeth? no we kind of talked and okay. he asked what I wanted to know. Daniel? Uh, I, I want to make sure, so from the picture that's there and from the drawing on page, shows 142. It, am I missing where it is? So oh, for the picture that was up there, it looks like it's supposed to be right next to it. Oh, the picture's go, gone. Go down a little bit. There's a better site. I was going to say, do we have Google Maps or Street View? Because that picture doesn't, it looks like there's a tree there and you can't see it. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, there's this. Yeah, so this is the house. In the right. We're almost looking at like this, and you can't. Yeah. But if that, I go back up. The, the, the site plans don't match. OK. Like here, isn't it supposed it's to be a, right next? To be. It, it, yeah, this, this yeah, picture is not the, the, the best <laughs> picture. Okay. Yeah, Google, there you go. <laughs> So it's it's okay. like I said, it's back about ninety feet or so. Okay. If we had a fall or winter picture, mm -hmm. <laughs> that would help. Okay. Okay, I think that's all I have right now because I think Liz and Brainerd answered my other one I was going to ask about, so I was on that little way. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Sam. Um, just to confirm the, the various opinions we got from various people on the Elm Heights Design Committee, so we heard back from them and they're split. Okay. okay. That's what I got. Thank you. On the questions. Duncan? I don't have any questions. Yeah, let's see. <coughs> any questions? Oh, let's I heard those casts over there. <laughs> let's move on to comments. I'll Leave your room. We'll call you back. Okay, I'll be out in the hallway. Yeah. Okay, Matthew. Well, I, I can understand the back and forth a lot of folks have had. Yeah. I've had some back and forth myself. Um, I think I'm comfortable approving this uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, the uh, owners haven't committed demolition by neglect. They inherited it like this. The previous owners did, but these guys haven't. Um, the, and everybody knows I'm sensitive to that. Um, the, uh, there, you know, this thing, you know, looks very hard to salvage. Um, uh, this is wrong! Please? It, it, who is that? Thank you. That's it's me. Sorry, I didn't know my video was or my um, audio was on. Sorry. <laughs> Obviously, I feel strongly to the contrary, and I just joined the meeting. My apologies. Oh, it's Who is this? Who is this? Mary Catherine Carmichael. She's Which? muted. <laughs> Which is what position does she? Is she on the M Heights Committee? Or? Oh no, she's, she's with the office, office of the mayor. mayor. She's on office of the mayor. Oh. Office of the mayor. Oh, okay. Okay. So she disagrees with my statement. The, the, the thing would be clearly. Right. <laughs> well, I, Mary, I know Mary Catherine. Okay. <laughs> well, welcome to that opinion. So um, she's in favor of keeping it. I, I well, she objects to my feeling that it would be very hard to salvage this. Um, I I think where I am swayed. I, I was I am and still am troubled by it turning into a two car garage. It is going to change the look. But I, I'm willing to go with it with the distance it is, 
back um, and the reuse of the brick on the front. I don't think it's going to be completely outrageous. Um, and I, I do think that over the long haul, that the new garage will be a benefit uh, to the community in the sense that the house will be more saleable to a wider range of buyers who would be interested in preserving the house. Um, so I get it. It's a tough one, but I, I think I can live with this. Thank you, Matthew. Bernard? Um, I would be a lot more comfortable if it was a single car garage that you just wanted to extend by a couple of feet to be able to fit a car in rather than making a, a huge two car mm -hmm. garage which I I mean there's an undertaking to rebuild it in a style that is in keeping with what is there already but you're on more than doubling or just about doubling what's there um I'm probably leaning towards approving it, um, but again, you know, I I feel a lot more comfortable if it was they were just going to build a single car garage um, in its place. Thank you, <coughs> uh, Elizabeth. Wow. <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> I, I'm leaning toward more what Bernard said. One, one and a half, two. But what can you do with one car garage when most people have two cars? So, wow. Yeah. This is this is a tough one. Yeah. So, with that being said, reluctantly. I have to go with him, but I prefer what you said. Don't <laughs> so, forget yeah. Catherine, so you from the yeah. <laughs> yes. Disagree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's my comment on that. Daniel, comments. Uh, yeah, I think I'm on that for like a, as a history person. I, I like sites and how all those buildings tie together. Like that initial comment from one of the. Um, Elm Heights people that you know all those buildings tie it to not just the house but the additional pieces but like Matthew said that they, they inherited this it, it is a mess and that's a hard struggle as the previous three commissioners have noted and I'm I'm leaning towards it for those reasons they did not put it in this position they did not do anything that endangered it they they bought it as is but who knows what's going to happen to it and if yeah that's that's just hard but it's in the end i mean i think i think it helps them and i think it helps the neighborhood instead of having this garage in rough shape because what, what else can you do with it uh, thank you Dan. sam ah so what can you do with it um if the garage wasn't there right now i, I think uh the petitioner's proposal makes a lot of sense. It's a very sensitively designed garage. It, you know, the materials match, the details match. It's a lovely garage. In any other neighborhood, I would be totally behind that. Mm -hmm. In this neighborhood, I cannot be behind that. The guidelines for me in this neighborhood are so clear. It's about the, the settlement pattern. It's a notable structure. Uh, the, the guidelines about demolition, it does not, the structure does not pose an immediate and substantial threat to public safety. It needs a lot of work. I'll give it that. You can pull the slab out. You need to like put a stiffer uh, lintel angle in to, you know, and, and a lot of the brick will probably need to be reset or repointed. It needs a lot of work. Um, but for me, these neighborhoods are about settlement patterns. They always have been, and I'll go back to this every single time, not just in this neighborhood, but anywhere. Mm -hmm. The size of the buildings, the relationship of those buildings to each other, that is one of the integral qualities that's so elusive that makes a place feel of a certain era, that gives it a certain kind of, 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 of atmosphere. Um, it's 90 feet back. 
So this is not going to be so in your face. True. But for me, these guidelines were written to protect buildings exactly like this. And unless the neighborhood wants to go back and change their guidelines, I, I you know, the way I read this is you got to save that building. So that's where, that's where I am on this. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. I'm so tempted to say no comment. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> I, I mean, this is, you know, the conundrum, really. And, and um, I think it is a place where guidelines actually can be pretty useful. I have repaired buildings in brick buildings in way worse shape than this, many stories taller, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with broken lintels and bowed walls. And, well, the the uh, Paris Dunning House, one wing was almost on the ground, we rebuilt it. So I, I know it's repairable, and I, and I think that gives credence to uh, Sam's comment um, about its significance. It, it doesn't have the physical integrity that we would like to see, but that's because it has been neglected. It wasn't this owner that neglected it, mm -hmm. um, but it's often subsequent owners who take on the uh, responsibility for stewardship. So I don't see that that's here nor there, actually. I, I think, I agree that I think the design is, is pretty sensitive. Um, I understand the desire to connect to the house, although I think I would, if I were going to build it as a garage, I wouldn't connect it. But, but um, I, I tend to think that the, here's what happens historically in these neighborhoods is cars come, some of the houses are built, and I like the question, was this garage original? Because it may or may not be. These houses were built at a time when there wasn't a lot of car ownership. And then as particularly wealthier people acquired their Model Ts and, and, and single cars, a lot of these garages show up. And we've been, I think, flagrantly violating the intention of preservation by allowing a lot of them to be torn down, particularly on the west side. Um, we've convinced a few people to duplicate them, but usually there, they're wooden structures that are so far gone that it's really difficult to save them. But, but I do believe, as Sam said, that they, they do help define the character of the house and the, and the subsequent neighborhood. So this question about whether it adds to the neighborhood to tear down an original building and build a new one kind of like it, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I want to weigh in on whether I think it adds to the neighborhood or not, or adds to the quality of life or not. I definitely understand the desire and need for, for a garage. I have cars. Um, so, I, so I, you know, I, like Gloria said, I think this is an easy one to be on the, on the fence about. But I, I think I personally, if if I were voting, I would weigh in on protecting the building as opposed to replacing it. Thank you, I don't have any comments, Allison. Comments? I do. Um, I would prefer to see the structure rebuilt with as many uh, original, the, the, the brick structure be, uh, what's the word, <laughs> rehabilitated. Um, you know, I think that that would be the smallest change that you can make to make um, this building more inhabitable, um, that garage more usable. But to come to HPC and say, here's this one outbuilding, we want to, you know, first of all, we want to demo and put something new up, not just restore it. That's an ask, right? That's already an ask. And then to say, oh, and now we want to connect it to the house. Oh, and also we want to make it larger. I think that the ask needs to be as small as possible in this neighborhood. Um, so as proposed, I would have to vote no. Um, I understand that people want garages. That's why I live in Park Regis. 
not in Elm Heights where there's not a lot of park like you know there's one story parks lots and that's when you you buy a home you weigh the pros and cons of living downtown or you know out in the burbs or down by the lake because you like the lake you know I mean when you buy a house that's a consideration um, I do not have uh, sympathy for uh, someone who's I mean in this regard not as a person but for someone who's owned a home for a year they certainly um, saw the project and uh, determined or saw the home and determined that 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 was something that they were willing to buy as is so um, I'm, I'm gonna have to vote no on on this one as proposed if they come back with hey we'll we'll rebuild the one car garage they're lucky there's a one car garage there I mean how much is it value would you add to that home if you had a two-car garage in Elm Heights? It's an expensive neighborhood, and you can get a two-car garage in that? <laughs> you got fine. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have any public comments? Uh, Mary Catherine, do you have a comment? Yes. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for <clears throat> excuse me, allowing me to speak. I'm actually in Wisconsin right now. I don't know if I can turn my camera on or not. I probably look crazy. Uh, <clears throat> I've been, I'm on vacation with my family, but um, as some of you know, I used to own this home. I bought it in 1999 and sold it uh, to the owner previous to the current owners. So I am well familiar with this garage, its uh, strengths and weaknesses, although I do understand that the um, woman I sold it to <clears throat> did um, not take very good care of the garage. But the question was raised, you know, what do you do with a one car garage? Well, you pit, you park one car in it. So that's what I did for 15 or 20 years when I owned the house and it worked out great. We actually, by the time my son was grown, um, we had three cars that we managed and, you know, we managed, uh, we parked in the street because we knew we lived in a historic district. Um, we voted for the historic district and we parked the one car in the garage, and that's just what you do. I mean, if you think about it, this is um, a somewhat urban area at this point um, as, as our community grows. And so um, this was not a bait and switch. When um, these folks bought the home, they knew that they were buying a home with a, an historic one car garage. This uh, topic of this garage came up a couple of years ago in front of this commission, and I was very pleased and relieved when uh, you voted to keep the structure. Um, it is um, absolutely matching the house. Uh, when I had both the uh, house and the garage tuck pointed, um, when I spoke with the mason, we got the you know correct kind of, um, it's not exactly grout, I guess, but I'm not sure the right, um, phrase and I'm sure everybody on this committee knows the right phrase but I don't but anyway if they were they are contemporary and so it's I mean it's just unique to the house and, and so I think it is important it is historic um, is it something that requires uh, a little workaround in order to uh, make it super useful yeah um, but again, you know, you make that choice when you buy in, in, in a historic district. The, it wasn't really historic. It hadn't been voted on yet when we bought the house. Um, and so we made a quick decision. Are we going to tear this thing down and build a bigger one in the back? Uh, because the land goes back quite far um, to the east. Um, and we decided, no, that this was, again, historic to this house, appropriate to this house unique in the neighborhood as far as you know the the house with the matching detached garage and um so i strongly request and hope that you guys will um please keep this garage i've spoken with other neighbors who um, when they found out this was on the <clears throat> docket tonight they did ask me to comment and so i uh, said i would get on and, and do that and um it's a great street it's really unique um it's a contributing structure, I believe, now. Um, and I think that that matching garage is actually part of why it's a contributing structure. So I won't drone on any longer. I am so grateful for your time and consideration. And thanks for the opportunity to speak, uh, despite my earlier outburst. So <laughs> thank you. have a good evening, you guys. I didn't notice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I'm a little passionate, so thank you. I 
Yeah. It was, we didn't know. Um, I have another comment as the current owner, Sarah Howell, I'm going to go ahead and speak up and make the statement that this home was on the market for close to a year, I believe a year and a half when we purchased it. And I know that we got in a bidding war with several different sorority fraternity people that were trying to utilize the home as space potentially for housing students. So I want to chime in and make that one single comment that we are happy to have the home as a single family home. Um, the other comment that I just wanted to bring up was just the aging in place thing. Yes. I understand we purchased this home and the home is what it is and it was built a long time ago. Um, but with that being said, we do have a resident in the home that is 75 years old and in order to keep living at this home and to keep maintaining this home, we need the capacity to have a garage that we can utilize, ideally attached doesn't necessarily have to be attached, but a garage in general that has a garage door that will actually work. So that's my comment. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll need a motion. Uh, I'll move to deny COA 22 55. Is that the right one? Hmm? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need a second. I'll, I'll second that. Thank you. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSoler? Yes. Matthew Seddon? No. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? No. We're voting. Allison Chopra. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, I have to move on. Uh, I vote yes. <laughs> Raynard Cross. Yes. Motion to not motion to deny carries uh, five two. Let's move on to uh, COA 22-56, 123 South College Avenue. I think Nate is with us. I believe so. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jacob. Yes. Okay, great. All right, Gloria. Okay, so COA, COA 22-56. Um, at 123 South College Ave, located in the Courthouse Historic, Courthouse Square Historic District. Um, the petitioner is uh, applying for new signage. This is a non-contributing structure and will have less restrictive review of existing exterior building changes according to the guidelines. However, new signage and this is a, a staff commenting, however, new signage visually impacts the cohesiveness of the entire historic district, whether the building is contributing or not. Uh, signs BND cover brick and are relatively large, although the building is not historic. So the guidelines really talk about covering historic brick. Um, here they are not covering historic brick. Um, and sign C breaks with the patterning of a historic district. Um, IS staff had been really back and forth with this. Uh, 
really okay with um, A. Um, so the signs are labeled A, B, C, and D. Uh, the sign A is just over the front lintel and is pretty subtle compared, to, and then signs B, uh, C, and D are much larger. Um, so staff recommends approval with the condition that sign C be eliminated, and here is just my logic. Um, sign C is the only sign that sticks out prominently. Uh, the other signs are subtler than sign C, and this is mainly in consideration, even though it is a non-contributing building, to the rest of the, of the patterning of the historic district. And with that, um, should I pass it on? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, is this Nate? Yeah, this is Nate. Additional information, Nate. Well, with the with the sign C, it's a big flag mounted sign because that's what the mayor wanted in the paper last year. He said he wanted big flag mounted signs all over the place. So I'm kind of surprised you guys are going to let that pass. Yeah, I didn't understand that. Um, there was an article in the paper last year about uh, taking, you know, putting big signs, big flag mounted signs back in the downtown district. And so um, I thought that would be approved. Um, the mayor said that's what he wanted to see, uh, you know, throughout downtown. So that's what I showed. Yeah, but Daniel, can you talk to that? Were you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's, two, there's two of us here. I, I'm not familiar with, with whatever article that he's referencing or talking about with that, so I'm not sure. Okay. Has anybody else seen that article? And how does it? How does it? I'm just clarifying. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So what would that mean? That big one there? Yeah, the one that you see. It B? C. C. On the right. Oh, C? C. The one that sticks out from the building. The, 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 the one hanging flat against the wall. It's like 90 degrees to your wall. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. All right, so why don't we move on to questions? Allison? Well... My question is, I'd, I'd like to know what the city's direction is on on these types of matters. I guess it doesn't matter, but it does. Um, Do we need that? It's um, disturbing. It's not like you don't have to wash it or something. Yeah, hi, Nate. Can you mute yourself in the interim, please? I'm sorry, you guys are cutting out. I can't hear you very well. Would you mute yourself for a minute, please? This way. No. Thank you. Thank you. So we don't have anybody here to answer that question, Allison. Okay. I don't think flag signs are allowed by planning without a variance because we had we had Lord, this is john if you want me to try and reach out to somebody in planning i can ask if i can during the meeting here if it's helpful yeah that that would we appreciate that thank you john well, let me see what i can find out um hang tight maybe you want to go back to this one or something but let me see what i can work on here and also uh, Just whether or not they're allowed by ready from planning that's still these would still have to be approved by planning. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 if it's approved or not by planning, that's a question for planning, but we're looking at it from an no, historic... I, I okay, so... But... Matthew, questions? I have no questions. I'm desperately searching for that article. <laughs> Bernard, do you it's have any like questions? one yes. sentence in a gigantic article. <laughs> 
Am I correct in interpreting the staff recommendations that they don't recommend the changes? C. C. The, C is the only one that they have an issue with. Um, Generally. I went back and forth on this one a lot because mainly because this is a non-contributing building. Um, had it been a contributing building or above, um, just the, the sign directly on the brick, what I mean is... You can't put them in the public right away. Which that would take. Um, so, uh, like, according to the guidelines, uh, signage um, histor obscuring historic building features, such as cornices, gables, pilasters, and other decorative elements, is discouraged. Um, but then there's things, wall signs, Building mounted signage should be of a scale and design as not to compete with the building's historic <coughs> character. Wall signs should be located above storefronts when possible, and signs in other locations will be reviewed on a case by case basis. So, this is a completely case by case basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, A seems to work, uh, B and C seems to be an issue. Mm -hmm. And then there's also D, which is like yeah, it's not a little storefront. It's pretty large. Oh, there's more. Yeah, uh, a, um, B, yeah. C, and D are all. But then the guidelines also say the non-contributing building should be a bit more flexible. So, <laughs> um, I do want to try to maintain as much as possible cohesion within the historic district. Um, even though it is not a historic building, it is part of this district. And it's non-contributing. Mm -hmm. Non-contributing. Yeah, it's a 1985 building. So it'll be historic in a few decades. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wait till five. <laughs> okay, that's it for me. All right. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have any questions? No, not really. Just waiting to hear if they come up with that article. But I, I really don't understand what bearing that article has on our decision. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. Just, well, the, <laughs> just background information. Okay. Okay. Doug. Uh, yeah. No questions. It's more of a comment. Okay. Daniel. Um, I guess this is for Gloria. If B wasn't so large, would that be such an issue? Is it the size, or is it just that it's attached directly to the brick instead of up higher? Yeah, so with B, I, I think the size, I was originally going to write like that. I didn't want to overcomplicate the conditions, so I just kept it to C. But as staff, I would prefer something a little bit smaller um, in scale that would not obscure so much of the and it's not it's not historic brick but it is sort of that same um landscape cohesion of landscape with the other buildings thank you Gloria. Mm -hmm. thank you sam i have no questions thank you well i understand why they're putting them where they're putting them uh, uh, the, you know in the traditional downtown you have these storefronts with header spaces above them that were traditionally used for signs. It makes placement mm -hmm. kind of automatic. And these are, you know, they want trying to catch you coming from all directions. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess I, I guess my, my biggest objection to them is that they're basically logos as opposed to just signs. So over the mm -hmm. front door is just telling you where you are. That's okay. The other ones are, mm -hmm. are branding. Mm -hmm. And I think they're too big for that purpose. Yeah. And the uh, the one in the right of way, uh, we looked that up, and you're not allowed to put a sign in the right of way. So that that's C, according to planning. So they would have to get a variance for that if we approved it. And I, uh, from planning. Thank you, Duncan. I don't have any questions at this point. Let's move to comments. Oh. Did you? Yeah, I was sort of, 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 I was sort of,
Never mind. I wasn't sure if you needed someone. Yeah, no, we serve with Allison. Oh, yeah, that's true. Okay. So, comments, Allison? No, thank you. Okay. Matthew, comments? Um, given that it's a non-contributing building, I don't have a problem with, uh, I mean, I, I hear the arguments, but I don't have a problem with A, B, and D, and I do think whatever the mayor may or may not have said, that C is out of character with the rest of the signage in the historic district and mm -hmm. would really stick out um, literally and and historically so I'm in favor of the staff recommendation Thank you. which is Renard I'm sorry the staff is just the objection to C yeah. yes formally okay. yes um I think I'm in keeping with with Duncan's Duncan, right? Mm -hmm. Duncan's position in that yeah. A is fine, um, C is not fine, and I'll join in by saying, you know, I believe that anybody who wants to find the bank knows exactly where it is. I mean, you don't need to stick a sign on every side of it. And there probably are more creative ways of, of signing the building that um, if a, they wanted to they could stick a sign somewhere that doesn't create any kind of issue so A is fine and I would probably oppose B, C, and D. Elizabeth? I like A and that's it. If you want to find a bank you look on the phone. Thank you Elizabeth. <laughs> Doug? Um, yeah, I, I guess because this building is not historic, I know we've, we've got our district guidelines, um, and I understand, I think I see what, I mean, I know what Duncan's saying. I mean, C just is out of character completely, mm -hmm. although I'll, I call it more of a blade sign than a flag sign, I guess. And, you know, old you know, look at like the Indiana Theater, you know, the, I mean, that's a blade sign. Um, but... And, and I think we used to see more of those, I mean, more signs that stuck out from buildings for hardware stores and things. But and my wonder about C is, is that, again, they're trying to catch traffic coming down college. Um, I could see if you're in your car driving down college and you, you aren't, because of the trees, you aren't going to see the main sign. Are you going to drive past this before you have to turn back around, um, at least your first time there? So I wondered about, you know, couldn't C be maybe on the building? Uh, again, I know they they uh, they don't own the lot directly next door where Lung Chung used to be, but at least it would still be visible for traffic coming down the street. Um, I don't. I'm not as bothered by B. Uh, it is a little bit large, but it's not bright orange or something that's gonna. You know, it sort of has got the brown tones that kind of blended in with the building. I think it's kind of large for where it's at because where you, I mean you're not going up the street that way, and you're certainly not but if you're sitting right there you you're it stopped in traffic and you just passed the bank when you crossed the street there but i'm not as bothered by those but i think c is i i agree with staff on c and i maybe see why maybe the petitioner could put something on the building instead of having a flag sign but again that's not really our purview that's it daniel yeah i'm inclined to agree with what the staff said i think b's rather large but it is what it is so. Sam? Um, <coughs> I've been looking at the guidelines and listening to all my fellow commissioners talk about this stuff and um, the guidelines feel like they're written I mean they most of the guidelines are written towards historic buildings and there's a lot more latitude for non-contributing buildings and I look at all of these signs and I don't find them to compete with this building you know this building there's not much to compete with, not to denigrate the building too much, but um, I've got no issues with any of these signs. Uh, the, the blade sign or the, uh, the flag sign or whatever you want to call it, it's not going it, to, I mean, it's, it's not in compliance with the UDO. I would not support a variance, but I'm not going to stand in the way of them asking for one. So I wouldn't have a problem with any of these signs, and I will um, sign off on it as is but I'm not going to step in any further than that. Sam, thank you. Duncan? No comment. 
<laughs> no comment. Yes, uh, John, are you with us now? Yeah, John. Um, so I got a little of planning just briefly, and so I can't speak and uh, I talked to Director Scott Robinson, and he um, couldn't speak to whether this is something the city has sort of advocated for. These are known, according to our conversation briefly, they're as projecting signs under the UDO. And so um, I looked up the standards for those, and I'm very reluctant to speak with authority about uh, whether they comply with standards. Well, it looks like page 211 of the UDO sort of lays this out if anybody wanted to pull that up or uh, may have a better interpretation than me, but they are allowed under the UDO and I heard some discussion about that, but can't speak to whether the city has sort of advocated for this type of sign or not, just that they are allowed under the UDO. So but I'll doesn't it there. But doesn't it project out into the public right away? Um, is that Sam asking the That's question? That's Sam, yes. yep, see you, John. Yeah. I can't, um, Sam, I'm looking, at projecting signs, following standards, apply to projecting signs. Um, there are a maximum of one projecting signs permitted per tenant per street frontage, of sub minimum separation, projecting signs, maximum of 54 square, 54 square feet, excuse me, in area. Um, uh, Sam, look and Sam, just give me a second. Um, I just saw something that said that they weren't allowed project out well they're the they're not except in certain circumstances okay. so kind of early earlier in the udo i you know to be not to sound flippant but if you do a control f for projecting sign i'm yeah. going through and yeah. reading the text accordingly okay. so um I, I think there is an exception for them um we go back any so um and so it says at, at the head of the udo any sign that projects outward more than 12 inches from the facade of the building in except as provided in, um, is prohibited, except as provided in section 20.04.100i. Uh, uh, and or rather section one. So you keep going down, um, you know, it's, guys, I don't wanna lead you astray here on, on being authority on UDO standards, but they are allowed. Um, I think we probably need to get more specific information if you've got more questions and we're happy to help facilitate that but i probably shouldn't go much further on trying to interpret the udo here for you uh, for fear of leading me down the wrong path unless i uh, can get something while you're parking here sam did i answer your question at all i didn't say anything about the right of way in there oh, uh, it's it's what it is um it, it doesn't actually change my position uh, so okay. let me get We'll keep looking here. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't fuss too much. But thank you. Thanks, John. Yep. All right. So, um, any comments from the public? Oh, um, John, if I may. Uh, sign project. Here's a in the index. Let's see right away. A sign attached to and providing out from a build, projecting out from a building face or wall, generally at the right angles to the building. Projecting signs include signs that are totally in the right of way, partially in the right or fully on private property. So I think there is some discussion there, Sam, about right of way, but not very specific that I can tell. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. It's just a matter of public works approval. I, I, I think it's because it's a removable item. They say you have to remove it at your cost, but you go and get a public works approval for a sign in the right of way. Yeah. Thank you. So. Um, we would entertain a motion. Mm -hmm. How should I say? I move to um, approve the um, COA with the staff recommendation of eliminating sign for C. Second. Second. All right. Uh, Doug Bruce? Yes. Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSoller? No. Matthew Seddon? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yeah. Raynard Cross? Yes. Motion carries uh, six to one. All right. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to 
COA 22-57 and 22-43 appeal. Okay, so today I'm actually just going to be presenting the ap appeal. Um, I think we weren't able to communicate, but I needed uh, pa additional paperwork for the roofing. Um, that said, so Roy Campbell had come to us uh, pretty recently for the uh, re with a COA application um, for um, sorry to work on the walls and the, for multiple um, actions to be taken on this property which was damaged by fire. Um, staff had approved all of the all of the things that had been asked for, including new siding vinyl siding on the condition that the siding would be smooth however roy campbell has since then done research with multiple different um uh, many not manufacturers but sellers and hasn't been able to find a smooth siding and therefore is appealing the appealing the material to allow for textured siding um the neighborhood association did comment that they were they were in favor of this as well he he actually asked for two things in the appeal um and here is where maybe daniel dixon can come in and help clarify because if both there are two issues and if one or both of them can be attended to today that would be wonderful um but he had also asked for the roof to be changed to um metal roof yes standing seam metal roof and um however um our legal department considered that would be better as a completely new certificate of appropriateness um why did this change on me okay of appropriateness because that was not part of the original um application that said the te the textured siding was part of the original application then in the packet you can find the letters from the different uh, sellers saying that you can, that the smooth siding is simply right now there's a lot of issues in terms of production and accessibility of materials and that this material simply cannot be found right now um, the neighborhood was okay with both the roof and the siding um, so I wanted to ask uh, multiple questions and this could be to um to daniel dixon as well as to the commission regarding whether to just um talk about the siding today or talk about the siding and the roofing as well um was the roof a part of the first coa uh, the roof was part of the first coa but it was originally just gonna be asphalt shingle i believe okay. daniel so yeah, the uh, the issue with the uh, roofing is that it was not. Um, I guess I think the first roofing was more considered an in-kind replacement and not necessarily a, a significant change, um, which is why I recommended that it be treated as a new certificate of appropriateness as opposed to an appeal. Uh, I think the roof was also um, approved kind of as is, and there was some debate about the the siding material during the last meeting. Um, I think there was some some mixed feelings about it even then. So um, that was why the recommendation was made for the group to be a new COA, just because it was substantially different. Okay, thank you, Daniel. So uh, questions? I'm sorry, Roy, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, the roof is still under question uh, as to whether we would do a metal roof. I I have uh, acquired a uh, proposal but I haven't got the results yet for that so uh, we may stay with the uh, asphalt the, the uh, thing that's going around is a, a, a sample of the uh, double four siding which is very typical and if you were probably more than three feet away from it you wouldn't know that there is any texture in that. Thank you. Matthew, questions? No questions. Bernard? 
um, color. White. White. The house is white now. No questions. Elizabeth, questions? No questions. Uh, no questions. Daniel. Sam. I guess the only question is more for Daniel, not Miss Daniel, but Daniel Dixon. <laughs> um, is there a, a, a compelling reason or an objection to not incorporate the new roofing material into this COA, or is it just just cleaner? Uh, so it's not. I'm just wondering if we can expedite this for the for the homeowner. I feel there's an argument given that the roof was part of the original COA. You could. You could consider it an appeal or an alteration of the existing COA. Mm -hmm. um, although it does sound like maybe you don't. There's some question about at this point whether it, there would even be a change to a, a metal roof. It sounds like maybe he's considering leaving it as is. So, gotcha. Um, I, I, you know, I can see how it could be left to your discretion on that and treating it as an appeal or not. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's move to. Right. I know when I originally decided to inquire about a metal about availability of a metal roof, I talked to John Vitella, um, and he, he and uh, he said that well, he, yeah, that should be no question about that in, <clears throat> in that neighborhood, and that could in fact be a staff decision. There are some new metal roofs that have been just installed down the street. Uh, one is on a residence and one is for that new market where uh, uh, the appliance store used to be. Mm -hmm. Both of those have. The have farm stand, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if I may yes, please. ask on another question. I'm looking through the... Well, first, Gloria, could you just confirm for me that the third bullet point, the historic district sub the Historic District Construction Subcommittee reviewed the documents and supports the change. The change that they're referring to is change from smooth to texture. Yeah, so I put uh, yes. their quotes there. Oh. Yeah, I put the exact quote there. Let me um, make this small so that we can see. But yes, um, uh, I put the full quote here. Um, I think part of the issue may be the HPC approved the COA, but with the condition of using the smooth, Vinyl siding in the meeting, the petitioner thought that suppliers would have that option readily available, so it made sense. Given the, that issue, I would be okay with releasing that condition and letting the petition move forward with grained vinyl siding despite our guidelines. Part of our goal is to make repairs and renovations practical and affordable, and having to special order the product could lead to additional cost delays, etc. I have no objection to the roof materials, per John's point about lack of mention in our guidelines. And then I have been following this conversation online. I concur with John's point about the roofing material and Richard's regarding the siding. I concur with their arguments and would recommend um, um, approval. Okay, and just a couple of questions. Um, the guidelines make reference to not being in favor of textured siding. Mm -hmm. And so if there was a non-textured, non-vinyl siding, that would meet the guidelines. It could, yes. Um, right, because I think the discussion is about whether to allow textured siding because non-textured vinyl, but I don't see any exploration of the argument of finding another material that is non-textured and approved. Would that be fair? Yes. Okay. And when, this is Prospect Hill, when did they become a historic district? Greater Prospect Hill. Greater Prospect 2014. Hill. 2014. And these houses that are being made reference to that have this type of vinyl siding, were they grandfathered in or were they since the guidelines were written? The in, ones that have textured vinyl? Right. I were they pre-guidelines or in which so, case the guidelines wouldn't have affected them by reference do you mean where in in these letters it said nine out of 18 homes have d4 d5 siding with brushed or wood grain yes yeah, so um this was a conservation district until 2014 i 
honestly can't tell you out of the top off the top of my head is, how many houses have textured um, or non textured siding. Is there anyone here that could comment? Well, not specifically, but it wasn't it wasn't regulated more strictly right. back back then. I'm, so so I I almost have to assume that. Right. Based I'm, on the guidelines that it wouldn't have been approved once it was a historic district. So. Right. I'm just trying to get a sense of how much weight I should put to the fact that pre pre the guidelines. Well, I mean, there's all kinds of yeah. things on houses that happened before historic district. Right. You're, you're, so you're, you're at the mercy of them. Right. So after the guidelines, the community made a decision, and I didn't see anything in the documentation to say that non-textured, non-vinyl siding was not available. Yeah, it's just that he's proposed what he's proposed. Okay. So I just want to contextualize the request. Okay. So, we need a motion. Did, did we go through all the comments? Yeah, I believe so. I didn't get to comment. Thank you. I don't, I don't have a problem with this siding, especially since the neighborhood people seem to have capitulated to their guideline. I don't know if it's a supply issue or not. Apparently, you can't get it, at least right now. Um, and I also don't have a problem with the metal roof. Um, there's plenty of examples of us allowing that. Uh, except that we might have to come, one, if he decides to put a metal roof on, if we approved it and he decides to put it on, he would have to come and get like a staff approval on the color or the, just, you know, whatever. Because he's not got a sample for what he wants. Mm -hmm. the, the metal roof, if it goes on, would be a gray, like medium gray roof. That's all I have to say. Sure. We need a motion. Yeah, I'm making a motion to approve um, COA 2258. 57. Oh, 57? Yeah, mm -hmm. COA 2257. Are we going to talk about the roof at all on this one? Or is that like that the roof isn't included in this? Uh, no. It's just well, as so, okay, so um, right now there's the COA 22 ah. dash 57 was for the roof, but it wasn't. I started working on everything, but I didn't get the, the paperwork in time. Um, so it's the COA 22 dash 43 appeal, and we can tack the roof on if you put make a motion to tack the roof on, or you can just work with the appeal for the wall for the siding. I'd say who's deciding. Okay. So we're, you're, you're, we're moving to approve the uh, appeal 22 okay. 43. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's your motion. And we have a second. I'll second. Okay, so just so I'm clear, uh, this is the appeal that this this is 22 appeal. 43. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Doug Bruce? Yes. Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSaller? Yes. Matthew Seven? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Reynard Cross? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Thanks for your patience, too. Yes. Okay, so we're fine. Finally, right. to yeah. Sorry. So, sorry. Uh, let's move on to uh, COA dash twenty two dash fifty eight, five hundred eight West Third Street, and I believe our petitioners are with us. <laughs> thank wow. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Gloria. Okay. Thank you so much for your patience and for waiting. Oh, you Um. So this is uh, Richard Judd is requesting for a new landing and staircase uh, on, the, on a small deck behind the house. Um, the deck would be a little bit, the, the landing and the staircase would be slightly visible from the right of way, from either, from both the alleyway 
that would run parallel to it and from Third Street. However, it would be very slightly visible and it would be made of the same material as the current deck. Um, the new construction would be attached to an existing deck and would not touch the historic structure per se. And the proposed landing and staircase would use the same materials as the existing deck. Um, and finally, so this is a staircase that's being built so that the owners can have a way to reach the basement. There is no interior staircase and the house is very small and they don't have space to do an interior staircase into the house in case of tornado. Um, this is also a very, very small lot and they are going through the variance process right now. They had originally up applied, started the application process quite a while ago and um, the kind folks of from planning and, and myself, we kind of put a stop to it and make sure that the variants would be able to go through. So they're working through that process right now. And um, Karina Pasos from planning um, felt comfortable enough to say like, okay, they can apply for the, for um, a COA now. Um, yes, because it seems to be moving along on that end. Uh, because they would be almost on the lot line. Um, so that said, this is the, the the deck in question, and the extension would be the same material, same color, same look, mm -hmm. same type of railings, and it would go down, uh, be made of wood, per, um, is parallel to it, and um, that's it. And so staff recommends approval of COA 22-58. Do you have anything to add? I'd like to make one comment. During this whole great process, by the way, I have, uh, they, planning came up with, this was, the house was remodeled. It's 1895, but it completely remodeled and done when we bought it here this time. But it was drawn, it was approved in 2015 for a deck to be built, you know, approved for the variance. And so I'm just going back through the process of getting them, building something that they were going to do and I can't find plans and anything was ever built so that helps. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, questions. Uh, Matthew, you have a question. Bernard? No. Elizabeth? Doug? No. Daniel? Sam? Uh, did we hear anything from the neighborhood? Uh, this is Prospect Hill property. So they don't have a... Nope. Okay, thank you. Duncan? I like it. I have no questions. Let's move to comments. No Matthew, comment. Renard, no, no comment. No Elizabeth, comment. Doug, no comment. Matt, uh, Daniel. <laughs> Sorry. You both got glasses. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I like it too. Thank you. Yeah, I just put an addition on my house to enclose an outside basement entrance, and uh, this is way easier. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I understand the need. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, we a motion? I will move to approve uh, COA 22 58. That's Sam. Second. Second. All right. Doug Bruce? Yes. Daniel Schlegel? Yes. Sam DeSaller? Yes. Matthew Seddon? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Reinhardt Cross? Yes. Motion carries 7 <laughs> zip. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I've become so weather aware since I moved here. This is a lot more comfortable. You're very welcome. Thank you for your well, questions tonight. Well, you're welcome. It's been a very it's a great experience. But, yeah. you know. <laughs> you can well, come back next can... week for like the fire pole edition, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. well that's what I've been told. <laughs> But it, uh, it really allows us, rather than walking down the alley and, that, and coming over to get into the, uh, the basement. We got a motion, let's go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Open your contacts. I'll be sending the COA in the next Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to new business. Uh, provide feedback uh, for the HPC as a consulting party. Okay, so. Um, in the eternal packet that never ends, I did send a very large packet this time. One of the many documents that I sent in, and I don't know if anybody had time to look at it, 
but it's the programmatic agreement. Let me find the entire name of it. Um, among the between the city of Bloomington and the Indiana State Historic Preservation Officer regarding the administration of certain HUD assistance projects and programs subject to 24 CFR Part 58 in the state of Indiana. This is a very dry document. It's a document I have to use quite often internally. It is my personal Bible for federal, uh, federally funded projects when Section 108 is triggered due to HUD funding. So two or three times a year, or maybe four or five, I do get sent uh, a request for a, a letter for the environmental reviews. Um, and so that's one of the multiple functions that I hold. And so you get to see and edit and see if there's anything weird or wrong or off or anything that you th think needs more oversight or more or anything this is pretty a pretty cooked document and it's a pretty close copy to the one that i've been using with some uh, it already has a few edits and alterations to put it up to date to 2022 from the last one we've been using from 2016 and um and yeah, so the people at state have edited it a bit. I tweaked some tiny things as well. Um, I, again, as a consulting party, so the HPC is one of the multiple consulting parties. So I just want to make sure that you are all in the loop with this process and that if you have a comment, provide, you can provide the comment. Um, we're still in the 30 day range that I set and I would have to look at the calendar to figure out what the deadline is. Um, it's in, in a week or two, uh, it's by the end of the month, basically, so by like the 27th of July. So if by that time any of you decide to look at this delightful and um, not heavy and very dry bureaucratic document, it actually does have some important things about it that can trigger a bill that me to have to start the process for a national register nomination, which would come back to the HPC. And it also has a component that requires certain projects to come for a certificate of appropriateness. So there is some connection to um, this, the, your functions. But again, it's, it's a document that I would be referring to more internally and whenever somebody requires a letter. So anyways, you don't have to comment now. <laughs> it's, it's again, another brick-like component within a brick-like packet you had. We don't need to vote on this. Um, if, if, I'm not sure how it's been done in the past, if a written document has been prepared, if there is an energetic discussion that you would want to have about certain components, or if you would like to bring it up at the end of the month and have some comments that I would be able to input before sending it back to state. Duncan? This is pretty much boilerplate year in, year out. I mean, we've been a consulting party as long as the state has had an agency. So I, I haven't, I didn't read through it again, but I know what it's for. Unless there are some edits in it that are meaningful, I, I mean, I guess I, I'd want my, I'd want to have my attention drawn to the edits, but uh, I think it's pretty much standard stuff. This is a national document. It's used across the country for 106 review, basically federal funding to local projects. So it's, I mean, we want to be a consulting party or we won't be in the loop. I agree. Okay. And, and I used to do a lot of these myself. And it's completely standard. I'm not sure why the SHPO wants to have the statement. They get to be the ones that say whether there's archaeology there or not because you can't determine that sitting at your desk. But if they um, want to take that on, more power to them, I would have made the city do it. Yeah, so <laughs> so for me, I'm required, if there is a, like an open piece of land that they're gonna dig, I have to not do anything about it, just say, hey, they're gonna dig on a piece of land, we need archeologists mm -hmm. involved. We don't, you know. No, 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 I just, <laughs> when I was a SHPO, I would have never said, sure, I'll go do all your archeology span for free. <laughs> I would say, no, yeah, the agency has to do that. The proponent has to do that, but that, well, if you want to flag that. No, 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 let them do it. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't call and ask me. <laughs> so uh, do we have any more discussion on this topic? Hearing okay. none? 
if any of you wakes up with the sweats at 3 a.m. any morning <laughs> thinking about the programmatic agreement, feel free to email me. <laughs> no problem, Gloria. Okay. So um, we have back on the table in our old business the grant for um, the Johnson Creamery. Um, and so, Gloria, you want to kind of fill us in? Yeah, so I um, added some additional context for this. This uh, I had brought this during our last meeting. Um, for those who uh, might want a re refresher on this, um, peer, uh, the city has has not neither asked nor requested, but has basically um, put an order, an unsafe building order on the smokestack um, due to its lean and they're going to have to spend uh, over $300,000 to stabilize it, so to lower it to 60 feet, but do, doing so carefully. Um, and the study that's, so part of the reason that I put the RC study there is because last time, that the RC study is the product of, that led to this conclusion, and it's a study that was done by RC Engineering, which are specialized in both historic smokestacks and other sorts of, uh, lots of historic engineering throughout Indiana. Um, and the consulting was not $20,000. They actually, um, oh, it's not here, but it's in the packet. They actually sent me the, the order. It was $15,000. It's still, a lot of money for consulting, so they were requesting the $500 BHPC grant. I did also attach the application form, which has all of the information that I have about the grant is simply what is in that application form, which is not a lot. It simply says that uh, $500 would be spent on a, on a consulting party that is either in the Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology's list of qualified professional or, or professionals or who has been vetted by the Historic Preservation Program Manager and it's to do a report on the exterior of a structure. So it, it's a pretty minimalist um, type of um, grant that the Bloomington Historic Preservation Commission can grant. Um, has the possibility of granting, and yeah. But the, the 2202 is just for the $500 BHPC grant, it's not for the 50K. Right. Yeah, no, it's not for the 50K. Yeah. So they are, the, they went to the BHP, the, sorry, they went to the BUEA last week, and the BUEA granted them 20,000, which is the maximum, um, as 50K would have gone above their budget for the entire year. Um, that said, they did get $20,000, and they, they used the certificate of appropriateness that had already been granted for the demolition as part of that process. So now this is for the five, what we're really evaluating here is the $500 grant, whether um, the HPC wants to give it to them or not. And I'll, let me know if you have any other additional questions. This has been a very long process and mm -hmm. I remember um, that it started, I've been working with the city for a year this week and I learned about Peerless and this process during my first meeting with the HPC a week before I started. So, <laughs> anyways. So, um, do we have any questions? Well, I, yeah. Um, I'm just reading the sort of the guidelines of the grant, which are pretty simple. Consulting fees. This is definitely consulting fees, but it's talked about associated with the rehabilitation of a historic property. And you know these guys are taking the thing down, so I'm and not. Call them to. Yeah, I understand that. Well, they're, they're stabilizing it, and they are tuck pointing as well. On the bottom. Yes, on the part that won't on be. On the little stub. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to make sure. I knew. <laughs> no, they're not going to tuck point the part they're going to. <laughs> 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 no. <Yeah. laughs> Historically, the grant. Pay a consultant to assist in the development of a facade rehabilitation. So, in other words, to give them uh, secretary standards guidelines. Sometimes I've done several of them. Even do a sketch to any, whatever to work with somebody who's reworking or returning a facade to its original condition. This is the first one I've seen proposed, sort of after the fact, to cover costs. 
but I think RC engineers, RC is certainly qualified as a consultant, and it's it's their consulting that led to everything that's happened since then. So in terms of this knowing about whether it's a stable or unstable structure, so it's not exactly the way this application, this money's been applied previously, but it is serving the same purpose, I think. But, it, but historically, it has also been used for like engineering assessments of the stability of an existing historic. I don't site. know of an example where it's been done for engineering. It was. It's mostly design consulting. Yeah, and the, the consulting was engineering. Mm -hmm. I know. That's but, what RC did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I, I mean, just, I'm I kind of it's feeling it's like it's not. Decide whether we want right, to. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I know, and I'm having. The some money goes to the clock to the to Peerless, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I don't know. It doesn't feel to me like it's actually what we've done before. I mean, I, I'm not. It's not, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it now. <clears throat> I hear what you're saying. That's cool, Troy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? But it's not an unreasonable argument. <laughs> I will still respect you if you do. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Well, so are we voting? We so we would have to make the motion. Uh, I, I just want to make one comment before Please. anybody makes a motion. I know, you know, we have not necessarily seen eye to eye with everything that Peerless has done. No, we have not. Nor and you know. <laughs> but but they did bring in a world class engineer to try and figure out what to do with this thing. And for better or for worse they are now doing sort of the best case scenario ish of what, you know what the possibilities are out there and they've had to spend a bucket of money just to figure that out and now they they're on the hook for 300k so i i won't feel guilty about defraying their costs by 500 dollars. i think it's a it's a goodwill gesture and we're going to have to work with these folks in the future on what happens with this and so i'm I'm gonna support this one. Well, Sam, make a motion. I'll I'll move to approve um, the HPC 22-02. And I'll second it. Okay. What the hey? <laughs> what? <laughs> How much work could you do? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Doug Bruce. Yes. Daniel Schlegel. Yes. Sam DeSolder. Yes. Matthew Seven. No. John Saunders? Yes. Elizabeth Mitchell? Yes. Raynard Cross? Sure, why not? <laughs> hey, motion carries six one. <laughs> okay, gosh, we got through all this. Do we have any uh, commissioner comments? Yes. I move that we restrict Nora from printing any document. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we only have two. Over a thousand pages. I, I think we should. Provide a realistic limit for Gloria. Um, <laughs> trees will thank you. And uh, do we have any public uh, announcements? Comments or announcements? I don't think we have any. Public. The public has fled. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then I move to adjourn. Second. All right. Yes. <laughs>